Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again to all the honorable members of parliament. Um, I just received the communication that this meeting is being live streamed on, on YouTube. Of course, it's going to be recorded. It's, as you know, the 42nd PGA annual forum. Uh, as practice of our organization, this meeting is a public meeting open to all the 1,100 and plus members of parliament of PGA from our 132 countries. Um, this year is excep exceptionally conducted online, uh, but next year will be in person and um, we will be ready to start uh, very soon um, at eight o'clock or, or some minutes uh, immediately thereafter. Let me repeat the announcement regarding the interpretation. You will find an icon on the bottom right side called interpretation, 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 uh, where you can choose either English, French, Francais, or Spanish, Espanol, uh, to follow the proceedings in the language of your preference. Oh, and I see uh, the president of PGA, Margareta Sederfeld, joining us. Uh, good, morning. good morning, good morning, Secretary General. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, even if it's on the online, but we have all of us get used to this format. So I am pleased to see you today and uh, look forward to our today's meeting. But I will give back, back the floor to Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I was just doing a preliminary announcements. I see also our uh, chairperson of the International Council from Pakistan, Navid Kamar. I think it's evening for you, am I right? Yes, I'll see you being at six o'clock, <laughs> just Wonderful. the right time. <laughs> well, not too bad, not too bad. I see uh, several board members, many distinguished parliamentarians joining us from different sides of the world. We have uh, more than 100 uh, registered participants, including of course our partners, colleagues from civil society, government officials, uh, but we expect a number to attend today, a number to attend tomorrow, which will be on the protection of the oceans. Um, maybe some of you hopefully will, will decide to attend both. Uh, all the proceedings of this event will be registered will be recorded and will be available online uh, on the pgaction.org website. And they are now also web streamed on our YouTube uh, channel. In fact, we're being recorded from this moment, this moment, um, very moment. Um, my name is David Donat Catena. I'm the Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Um, we are not starting yet, but um, I would like to allow maybe a couple of minutes extra for all our participants to connect. Let me continue with these announcements. Um, this is the 42nd annual forum of PGA. Any member of parliament or observer is invited to attend. The meeting is web streamed and live streamed as well as registered. Um, Today and tomorrow, we will uh, develop our proceedings from 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Central Eastern Time in the United States, which corresponds to 2 p.m. to uh, 5.30 p.m. Uh, Central European Time, corresponding to our Hague offices. But we are very delighted to see so many of you coming from so many time zones, even very early in the morning. The official co-host of our event is the Parliament of Belize, and uh, we will hear soon from the Speaker of the Parliament, who is a board member of PGA. Um, and once again, maybe for the final time, if I'm allowed, uh, you can follow uh, and participate actively in the proceedings, because this is a meeting, it's not a webinar, um, by also intervening, requesting the floor, making use of the chat bottom or the uh, and uh, um, sign uh, in your reactions. And you can do so in three languages, English, Spanish, and French. There is an icon on the bottom uh, uh, right side uh, on interpretation, and you can choose either of the three languages for you to listen and also, of course, to intervene. I also see that many distinguished 
panelists and experts are joining us, starting with Professor Carothers from the United States. Good morning, Professor. Good to be with you. <laughs> Wonderful. And as you know, this uh, annual forum comes just a few days after the end of the World Summit of Democracy that uh, President Biden hosted in Washington and virtually. So we will have a perspective from that. I also see our colleague from, uh, I believe Melbourne, Australia, if I'm not mistaken, am I right? Tom Daly. Yes, indeed. Uh, okay, Dr. Lee. In Melbourne, but an Irishman. Okay, wonderful. Well, but what, what time is it in Melbourne? It's just midnight here. We're used oh. to that kind of time here in Australia if you want to do anything internationally. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. And it shows the, the the, uh, how addicted all of us are to PDA to see that it's morning, <laughs> it's evening, it's midnight, it's the mid of the day, and we are still here. It's absolutely amazing and also during this COVID time uh, to be here it's of course uh, uh, sad thinking about COVID and everything it have uh, done to all our people and the harm it have caused but it's important that we as parliamentarians continue our work and we do so and I think it's impressive to meet with you all colleagues from all over the world and continue the dialogue with, with our uh, this discussion. So, so I can't say how grateful I, I am for this because it's a huge opportunity. And a lot of us, we are also struggling with the COVID as we don't meet, we don't see, and it's difficult to get this kind of discussion. But here, PDA is strong as ever. It's absolutely amazing. Thank, thank you, Margareta. And I think we reached the five minutes, five minutes past the indicated hour. So we can all accept that this is a, a, a normal delay. And on behalf of the Secretariat, uh, as Secretary General, I'm very happy to give the floor now to the two opening speakers and hosts of this event, the Speaker of the Parliament of Belize and the President of Parliamentarians for Global Action, to this 42nd annual forum of PJ, um, day one entitled The Antidote to uh, Authoritarianism, Parliamentarians as Champions for Democratic Principles and Institutions. Honorable, Honorable, mm -hmm. Valerie, yeah. Honorable Valerie Woods, the Speaker of the Parliament of Belize and Honorable Margareta Sederfeld, President of PJ, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I would like to start to give the floor to uh, uh, Senator Valerie Wood as host of uh, our annual session. So please, I, I will go in a second. Please, uh, Senator. Thank, thank you, uh, Margareta. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever um, you are. And I echo the sentiments of uh, Margareta, that um, indeed it's unfortunate we can't meet in person, but we have all become accustomed to this reality of online meeting. Glad to hear David says that perhaps next year uh, we will attempt to do this in person. Um, nonetheless, it's very good to be in the virtual company of all of you from around the world. Distinguished colleagues and participants, on behalf of the National Assembly, of Belize, it is my distinct pleasure to host this momentous event and to be here with you today. This annual forum has a, has a special format. It is divided into two thematic sessions of fundamental importance to all of us. Today, the 16th of December, participants will discuss the role of legislators in protecting and advancing democratic principles and institutions. Tomorrow, the 17th of December, Participants will engage in the second International Parliamentary Oceans Day and discuss how to take constructive action to protect the world's oceans and the sustainable livelihoods of those who depend on them. The topic at hand today affects us all, especially in this global context of uncertainty, 
brought forth and aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Institutions have been weakened. Governments have taken emergency measures to curtail the spread of the virus. And people worldwide have suffered discrimination and oppression, further deepening inequalities. My country, Belize, and the region at large have not been spared. Authoritarian tendencies have gained momentum and contributed, including in our hemisphere, to the radicalization of the political landscape. The use of social media has increased the prevalence of misinformation and propaganda. Consequently, media freedom has become even more essential. I would also add that open parliaments, the need for our parliaments to be more open has become even more critical than ever. Although the panorama is not optimal, democracy is the form of government that best fulfills our human aspirations and allows for the full expression of our freedoms. As parliamentarians, we must continue engaging with our governments, constituents, civil society organizations, and all other relevant stakeholders to ensure that the preservation, preservation of the integrity of our democracies and support for human rights defenders worldwide who suffer under authoritarian regimes remain at the forefront of a common agenda. Innovation has played a very big role in the past two years, evident by the fact that we're hosting the annual forum in this format, during which some countries have endeavored to make progress on transparency through e-government, allowing government information to be open and accessible for everyone. Other areas of progress include efforts to ensure that women and girls, ethnic minorities, in indigenous peoples, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex LGBTI persons can overcome obstacles to access basic services, the enjoyment of their rights, and their full participation in political, economic, and social life. On this occasion, as it is her last annual forum as president of PGA, I would like to personally thank Ms. Margareta Sederveldt for her leadership in Sweden and worldwide on issues pertaining to democracy, human rights, inclusion, peace and security, as well as international cooperation. She has inspired us to be better parliamentarians and she has led our PGA network exceedingly well. Thank you. I turn it over to you, Margareta. Thank you very much, uh, dear. Uh, colleague and thank you so much uh, Valerie for your very kind words and also important open remarks for today's uh, annual session. Esteemed college, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to thank the National Assembly of Belize and my dear colleague and speaker of the House of Representatives of Belize. Honorable Valerie Woods for co-hosting the 42nd PDA Annual Forum. I would also like to thank you, dear colleagues, for taking part in the annual session. And I think it's impressive to see that we are registered, have registered 137 participants from more than 40 countries worldwide, from six continents, South America, uh, North America, Africa, Europe, Asia, Oceania. It shows that we as parliamentarians believe in democracy. We believe in multilateralism and we believe that we can make changes, but we have to also believe and see our responsibilities. Our responsibilities to be those who stand in the front line, who represent our voters, who represents our constituencies, who have elected us. I would also like to thank you, express my gratitude to PDA Secretariat. I know that you have had very difficult times, just as everybody of us, but you have adapted very quickly to the new situation during the COVID and made it possible for us as parliamentarians to continue our work and also to hold this annual forum. And I, I 
would also like to say to all of you that this meeting will be continue to be chaired from by our Secretary General, David Donald Cate. And it's because that the Secretariat is the one who have invited us for, for this meeting. So they are in control of the invitation and also all of us participation. So I think the, this is really, uh, I would like to mention this because it's important that the meeting is conducted in a good way and good manner where everybody can get the floor and uh, it goes together with who is the chairperson. So after my introduction speech, I will give the back floor back to Secretary General David Donatate, who will uh, uh, be leading us through today's meeting. And I would also like to say that it's really a honor for me to welcome you here today for the first day of the forum. And it's titled The Antidote to and authoritarianism, parliamentarians as champions of democratic principles and institutions. This meeting represents a unique opportunity for exchanges between legislators and experts on how to address attacks on democracy and ways and means to prevent and counter such attacks. Democracy is a vast topic, and we will hear from experts who will assist us in having a robust conceptual framework for target, targeted actions. And in this spirit, in November 2018, thanks to the support of the governments of Canada, PDA inaugurated its core campaign for democratic renewal and human rights after noticeable trends of democratic backsliding in many countries in all parts of the world. These trends have been exacerbated uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has claimed countless lives and left nations struggling uh, to tackle not only the health crisis, but also the democracy crisis and the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, it is not a secret that increasing consensus holds that democracy is under decline globally. According to the 2020 Freedom in the World Report, 21 is the fifth, uh, is the 15th uh, conse consecutive year of decline in global freedom. This is worrisome and has become an important policy focus. On the 9th and 10th, December, US President Biden held the first of two summits for democracy, bringing together government representatives from around the world, civil society and the private sector to set forth a concrete agenda to tackle together threats that democracy faces. And the elements of democratic backsliding include the progressive erosion of democratic principles, such as separation of powers, checks and balance, independence of the judiciary and equality before the law. The rising participation of disinformation, the incre incremental dismantling of pro protection of press freedom and the weaponization of the media. The increasing corruption at the highest level of government and in sometimes also at parliamentarian level. And the repression of vulnerable populations and minorities, including opposition members, journalists, human rights defenders and legal professionals. As human rights abuses amass, democratic practices are, are abandoned and justice uh, retreats. We, members of parliament, are on the front line. We have the mandate and the responsibility to stand against dangerous trends and support our colleagues working to protect fundamental, fundamental human uh, rights as well, as civil and political rights, as representatives of the democratic branch closest to the citizens, 
legislators can resist attacks on democracy, shapes national agendas, resist executive incursions, and work with civil society to preserve civic and political space. But too often, legislators find themselves increasingly at risk of suffering physical and psychological harm. Democracy is fragile and must be uh, nurtured and supported by all. I seize this occasion to sincerely thank the distinguished panelists who are with us here today, joining from different time zones, at times at very late hours. We look forward to their participation and subsequent conversations. Uh, but I would also like to give you a short picture from my part of the world. Today, I am actually here in Washington. I can say, tell you that it's a different Washington from what I know. I could see how people have left the city because of COVID. I can see how people suffer because of COVID, lost their jobs. How restaurants and shops are closed, but still there is a belief in democracy. I am from Sweden and in our neighborhood, we do also see the threat of democracy. Let me just mention the small country, Belarus. Since the country was being independent from former Soviet Union, there have been one leader, President Lukashenko. If he is a president or not, I will not say anything about this because the elections that have been have been observed by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, Parliamentary Assembly, together with UDIR and the OSCE governmental side. And all the reclaims that we have put forward over the years are still actual. When it was the election 2020, the leading opposition figure was jailed. And this shows that the democracy, it's of course very fragile. There is a need for parliamentarians to have a space, just what I talked about earlier, how everything goes together. And the jailed opposition leader, Sergei Tikhanovskaya, did yesterday get the decision from the court, it was not a free decision, that he is jailed for 18 years. There is an opposition movement in Belarus. It's led by Sergei, Mr. Sergei Tikhanovsky's wife. Uh, and she decided immediately that she needs to do something for her country. She left the country together with her family to a neighbor country, Lithuania, where she stays these days. She's working together with the people in Belarus, even if she's not there. She's trying to get support outside of Belarus from the rest of the world to be aware what happened in Belarus. And this shows the importance of multilateralism for work together. But Lukashenko is not only threatening his own people, putting people who resist in jail. He is also using other people as weapon as bullets. He is taking migrants, other vulnerable people who wants to have a new life, a better life, to Belarus. He has given them fake new promise that they are allowed to go to European Union. I see what's happened in Belarus as a terrible, ter most terrible example of how a dictator is misusing his power, misusing his power. And this is one example. There is a lot of other examples. And we, as parliamentarians, we have to act, not with limited people, but with the support of rule of law, with the support of democracy, and with support of a free world. And I, would like, I'm sitting here with the computer, that's why I have some problems sometimes to get on, at my document, but let's see. 
Before giving the floor to the distinguished key, uh, key speaker, I would like to quickly remind the audience of a few housekeeping roles to ensure that the meeting runs as smoothly as possible. For security purposes, please do not share your link on public forum. If you wish to invite individuals, kindly share the registration link. Second, interpretation in English, French, and Spanish are available. Please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and choose the language you would like to listen to. And here I would like to say thank you to our fantastic secretariat again, because it's them who do the interpretation. Thank you. If you are not speaking, I would kindly ask you to mute your microphone to bring background noise, noise to a minimum. We kindly ask that you have your videos turned on unless you do not wish to appear on the video. And then during the interactive sessions, we kindly ask you to use the raised hand function or request the floor in that chat box to speak slowly so that interpreters can translate questions or comments accurately. The meeting will be recorded by organizers for institutional purpose. And then I would also like to say, this is my last annual forum because we have a very good practice in PDA. It's not only a practice, it's in our rules of procedures that the is a limited uh, period to be able to be elected to the positions in PDA. It includes all positions, also the president. So I have served for four years for president and I will step down at our international council meeting this Monday. And I must say it has been a pleasure to serve as president and to act together with all of you because it's important. We are working together and we do a fantastic job. And it's thanks really to the cooperation we have had both as parliamentarians all over the world, but also with the secretariat and their knowledge and skills. But now allow me to give the floor to Professor Thomas Carotas, uh, Harvey Y. Finberg, Chair of the Democratic Studies and Senior Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for his keynote uh, remarks. And Professor Carotas, the floor is yours. Mostly welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction and uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, I've been asked by the organizers to say a few words about the Democracy Summit that the United States convened last week, but also to say a few words about women's leadership and representation in the current international context. So let me do that. Let's start with the Democracy Summit. <clears throat> so the summit was held last week. It was a two-day affair, about six hours each day. It was virtual by necessity. 89 heads of state took part. Uh, they took part in the form of three minute speeches that they submitted by video. And all of these speeches were streamed live at the summit. In addition, there were a number of summit sessions. President Biden opened the summit. And then there were some closed plenary meetings with heads of state and President Biden. And then there were also some panels on the three different themes of the summit, which were countering authoritarianism, supporting human rights, and fighting corruption. In addition, a number of civic actors took part in the summit as well as some private sector actors as well. So why did the Biden administration convene a summit in the first place? I think there were really two things motivating the Biden team to do this. And it took a lot of work during the first year of their administration to plan this summit. So it wasn't something they did lightly. The first reason was they had a strong desire to signal a shift in US policy in the transition from President Trump to President Biden. There were many areas of shifting policy, but the Biden team really wanted to send out a clear signal to the world that the United States is returning to the stage of support for democracy internationally. And they thought a summit was a way to do that in a very tangible way. 
I think the second purpose was to get together a lot of democracies uh, in order to create some clear sense that democracies are willing to stand up together on behalf of the democratic values and to work together. So it was also an intention to create a partnership approach to this topic, again, somewhat in contrast to the previous administration. But the summit was not, and we should be clear about this, the summit was not an effort to create a democratic alliance, an ongoing alliance of countries. It was not an effort to create an ongoing club or grouping that would continue past the summit framework. And the summit framework was the summit last week virtually, a planned summit about a year from now, and in between what they're calling a year of action of follow-up activities to connect the two events. But there is no intention, at least currently, beyond that second summit next year uh, to continue this sort of mechanism or grouping. So it was not the creation of a democratic alliance in any way. Now, there's a lot of debate over the summit <clears throat> prior to it. And let me just summarize the criticisms of the summit and the more positive views. The criticisms, and there were many, both in the United States and abroad, focused on four points. First, there were criticisms of the invitation list. The Biden folks took what they called the big tent approach to the summit, which was to invite a lot of countries. And some of the countries they invited did not score very, do not score very highly on um, the major democratic indicators like varieties of democracy, um, which we see Stefan Lindbergh here with us, who runs that fantastic um, organization that analyzes democracy worldwide. So a number of the participants were actually relatively low on those scores. So there was some criticism of why them, why should they be included? And some others who were even a little bit higher were not included. So there were accusations of a bit of politicking on the invitation list. Second, there was the argument that a summit of this type creates a division in the world between some countries and others, and that that's an unhealthy thing to do. Now that criticism came from China and Russia who wrote together, interestingly, a joint op-ed by the Chinese and Russian governments objecting to the summit and saying that they are fully democratic themselves and arguing that the summit should not divide. But others, not just the Chinese and the Russians, but others uh, felt that the summit is too divisive. A third criticism of the summit was credibility on the United States' part. United States democracy is troubled in a number of serious ways. So some people said, what is the United States doing? Convening a summit on a topic, it should focus on its own internal affairs. And the fourth criticism was mm, a summit is too much show and not enough substance. It's a form of political theater that isn't really fit for purpose in today's uh, difficult democratic context. So those are some of the criticisms. On the positive side, I think the enthusiasts of the summit or at least supporters of it pointed to a couple of things. They felt it was a useful signaling and they said the mere fact that the Chinese and Russian governments felt compelled to write something about it is an indication that the summit got people's attention in the world and you know people talked about it here we are talking about it today so it, they said see it is signaling second some people enthusiasts said that it was useful to have governments come together and have 89 heads of state each individually say why they're committed to democracy and how they intend to strengthen democracy in their own countries that that simply hasn't been done for a long time if ever and so it's a good thing to do and then third, uh, the third praise for the summit was that, that it was an opportunity for some follow-up work that could produce some tangible outcomes. And I'll, I'll finish with this last point, and that raises the question of what might those outcomes be. And I would say the main hope of the summit planners was that by making commitments at the summit, if governments were to make commitments and say, we are going to improve this, pass this kind of reform measure, do this or that, that making those commitments publicly would then allow uh, actors in those countries, as well as transnational actors, to try to hold those governments to account and say, you promised you would do this, you made this commitment, now when are you going to do it? And so there's been talk about how to set up monitoring mechanisms to synthesize all of these commitments and put them forward, and then to monitor whether or not governments um, follow up on their commitments and to put some pressure on them if they don't. And some people hope that the second summit will be a form of incentive. In other words, you won't get invited to the second summit if you haven't followed up in adequate ways on the commitments you made at the first summit. Whether that happens or not, I'm not really sure. 
Um, and I would say that's the biggest question mark coming out of the summit. I have just a few more minutes, but I would like to say something about <clears throat> women's leadership in the current context. But let me put a bit of perspective on that question. We live in a world of democratic backsliding, unfortunately, what people call a democratic recession and uh, analysts have charted with democracy moving backward in the world in the last 15 years. But what's notable is that women's political participation, uh, both at the level of everyday citizens participating, but also at the level of uh, representation of women in parliaments and other bodies, um, has increased during this time. And so it's important to realize that women's political participation is one of the few bright spots uh, in a landscape of international democracy that's pretty troubled. And so it's important to think about the significance of that fact, uh, that we do have an important bright spot in a somewhat dark landscape. And what's interesting is that the progress on women's leadership is quite widespread. An interesting statistic, for example, is that the level of women's representation in the United States Congress is lower than the average representation of women in an African national legislature. So Africa is doing better in formal terms on representation of women in politics than is the United States. So the progress that we see is quite distributed around the world. It's not concentrated in one part of the world and deconcentrated in others. And that's actually a very important phenomenon. But in recent years, there's been a lot of backlash against women in politics and a lot of violence. There's horrendous violence and repression of women politicians and women activists. Why is that occurring? Partly it's a pushback by entrenched power holders, some countries where women have made gains and those who don't like that, who feel threatened by that are simply pushing back and saying, we don't want them to have so much power. Part of it is that there's a new, I would say conservative or rather anti-progressive narrative and ideology in a number of countries that uh, resist gains by women, but also by other um, traditionally underprivileged or marginalized groups and this conservative backlash in a number of countries is affecting women's participation quite strongly. Third, there's a, just a growing harshness of political life and use of violence in many places. There's just an increase in violence against activists, against journalists, against all kinds of groups who are pushing for change, not just women. So they're being caught in that as well. And then fourth, the pandemic has fueled some backward motion for women's representation is in many countries with, in a COVID context, women are uh, the primary caretakers in many families and therefore have less time to participate outside the home in politics. And the pandemic puts pressure uh, on societies in ways that put women at the fore uh, and make it more difficult for women to advance their political objectives. Now, there's no single answer to this overall backlash against women, but to keep a perspective that, that women's representation is a fu fundamental area of progress in the last 30 years, that more women's leadership uh, is the answer because that leadership gives greater attention to the specific issues that I was just talking about, the different forms of backlash. Uh, more women's leadership helps normalize women in politics and overcome those narratives of sort of anti this or anti that. And third, more women's leadership creates more alliances because it's been shown empirically that women politicians work together more across party lines and across national lines than do men politicians. And so more women politicians means better alliances and stronger cooperation. So they're very important reasons to focus, to continue a focus on increasing women's leadership. So that's a bit about the summit and a bit about women's leadership. I'm not sure if there's any time for questions or comments. I'd love to engage in the discussion. We have time, but I have a feeling it's a tight agenda and you may need to move on to the next thing. But thank you for the chance to speak to you. I wish you all the success with your meeting. Thank you, Professor Carothers. And uh, I think there will be time for discussion uh, under the first panel. But if there is any commentary or question that any uh, distinguished member wants to make, of course, we should not uh, lose that opportunity. Then if it, that's not the case, um, without further ado, I will give the floor to the chairperson of the first panel who is a distinguished board member of PGA, Honorable Kasturi Pato from uh, Malaysia. Um, 
please, Honorable Pato, without further ado, take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, to my esteemed colleagues and participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Kuala Lumpur. Before we start with the first panel of the annual forum, I would like to remind you that interpretation in French and Spanish are both available. Please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and choose the language you would like to listen to. We will now start with the first panel dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and the rise of authoritarianism worldwide. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged governments worldwide. There are worrisome regressions into authoritarian models of governance in efforts to contain the virus. From the enactment of disproportionate emergency measures to attempts to bypass or suspend effective democratic controls on government, democracy, civil and political rights, fundamental human rights have suffered a serious toll. And this could potentially bring about other types of pandemic no less deadly than the pandemic itself. Our first speaker could not join us today as he is traveling, but he thought it is important to share with us a few thoughts through a video presentation. Mr. Clement Vaux wears many hats. He's the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and of Association at the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mr. Vole is also a researcher at the Geneva Academy of International Law and Senior Advisor at the International Service for Human Rights. I would ask the PGA Secretariat to please play the video presentation of the Special Repertoire, which will focus on what the UN system has done to raise awareness and curtail their effort of violations of civil and political rights on democracy and vulnerable populations. to the Parliamentarian for Global Action, and to the Parliament of Belize for the kind invitation to such an important forum. I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you virtually today, as I'm currently on mission in the field, and appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts through video. The COVID-19 pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges to the human rights around the world, including to the exercise of the right to peaceful assembly and of association. Governments all over the world have taken extraordinary steps to respond to this rapidly evolving crisis and protect people's health. Many governments have responded to the global health crisis with a human rights perspective. I applaud those efforts. However, I have witnessed worrying trends and limitation on both the right to peaceful assembly and on civil society ability to support an effective response and recovery. We are seeing the most comprehensive rollback of civic freedoms since the end of the Cold War, including crackdown on protests, anti injury law, killing and criminalization of human rights defenders, journalists, and trade union leaders, and the stigmatization and intimidation against civil society leaders. We have observed how old and new tactics of repression and control are used with increasing sophistication. We continue to see the adoption of sweeping emergency law to rule by decree. Repression disguised as legislation is the tool of the new authoritarianism. With a facade of legality, many repressive governments across the world are threatening the existence of civil society. Some of the measures adopted have been geared toward cementing control and crack, cracking down on oppositional figures rather than ensuring public health. A trend toward the militarization of crisis management is similar warning. The criminalization of peaceful protests and indiscriminate and excessive use of force to repress it has become another mark and dangerous trend in both in a democratic 
and authoritarian country, but particularly severe in the letter. Assembly and protests are equated with threat to national security. States' authority respond with violence and the heavy hand of criminal law, anti-terrorism legislation in particular. We have witnessed numerous cases of killing and injured and the detention and torture of protesters worldwide, many under trumpet charges as part of unfair trials. The willingness of state authorities to engage in dialogue and negotiation seems to continue to decline. Civil society organizations, including trade unions, are also facing numerous restrictions on their work, including a lack of access to the necessary personal protective equipment to continue to do their work safely to retaliation and imprisonment. Several states have adopted new measures penalizing the, spread, the spreading of fake news or have increased re reliance on similar provision on law already in place. Restriction to the exercise of freedom of peaceful assembly and of association online are shaping the future of civic space. We observe an increase in the number of prohibition to the access online content and, plat and, and online content platform, including social media and the use of overly broad provision often established in cybercrime laws to restrict online content. We have seen how very sophisticated digital surveillance tools can be used against civil society actors and journalists without any accountability. We have seen how these tools can be, to in, can be used to enable brutal killing of these actors. Frequent internet shutdown and disinformation campaign are used to silence and confuse communities at a time when information is most needed during demonstration and election. We have also seen the rise of an anti-right discourse in many countries around the world. In April 2020, I expressed my concern about these issues in the context of COVID-19 and launched a set of 10 principles that provide recommendations to states and other key stakeholders to ensure their response to the pandemic do not infringe upon the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. The guidelines are based on the premise that the effectiveness of measure to defeat the COVID-19 outbreak depends on the ability of government to secure people participation and trust. No country or government can solve the crisis alone. Civil society organizations should be seen as strategic partners in the fight against the pandemic. But most importantly, civil society will have an important role in helping country mitigate, adapt and transform from the devastating and long-term socioeconomic development effects of, the, of this crisis. The right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association are essential to all human rights, development and peace, the three pillars of the United Nations. They are crucial for democracy and the tool that empower ordinary people and those at the margin of society to transform the world around them, to defend their rights and shape their future. Since I was appointed, I have seen the power that civil society can wield in from its establishment over 10 years ago, my mandate has been crucial in, adv in advancing, in advocating for these rights, considering its interlinking with other rights and its significance in building together a peaceful and inclusive world where no one is left behind. 
It is not incidental that the UN Secretary General issue on the issue on the United Nations 70th anniversary the call for to action for human rights and the respective common agenda, where he emphasized the importance of public participation and civic space in the pursuit of the fundamental freedom and compliance of 2030 agenda for sustainable development. My mandate thematic reports provide a, blue, a, blue point, a blueprint for the legal and institutional reform and provide guidance to the states on responding to emerging challenge and better protect the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. My mandate issue, practical recommendation and best practice aim at supporting states in the implementation of their human rights obligation in order to ensure the enjoyment of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association in the context of the 2030 agenda. In my 2019 thematic report, I have detailed how over the past decade, states have used technology to silence, survey, and harass dissents, activists, and protesters, while my 2021 report focused on access to justice as a vital to prevent future violations and abuses. Also, the General Comment 37, to which I contribute significantly, entails provision on strategies to ensure civic participation, especially those who advocate for the most marginalized groups. Association and civil society organizations should be allowed to form and receive funds, both national and international, without interference. These associations and human rights defenders should be protected when they decided to assemble, be it independently, spontaneously, or with anticipated notification. It is a key that the notification regime are not considered as permission or prior authorization. Peaceful assembly, especially, especially on matters that are critical and stigmatized within national borders, such as LGBTI, migrant workers, refugees, minority groups, environmental human rights defenders, indigenous people, workers, and people living in poverty must be protected, if needed, with the support of law enforcement. Also, peaceful counter-protesting must be protected. The mere fact that an assembly tackle a critical issue does not justify to consider this assembly as violent. It's also not enough that some participants within a demonstration or counter demonstration portray violent conduct to brand the whole assembly as peaceful. Taking stock on the progress made to protect these rights, I'm pleased to know that the mandate has increased the attention of the international community for the need for greater protection. Particularly, it has helped to strengthen the normative framework. My mandate work, works with civil society, human rights defenders, and other to denounce and expose states' responsibility for human rights violations and relay such information to other international institutions so that they may be held accountable. In addition to acting, on individual cases of reported violation and concern of a broader nature by sending communication to states, asking for clarification and action, we engage in advocacy, raise public awareness, and provide advice for technical cooperation. Tackling impunity and advocating for accountability for violation is another area my mandate has been focused on as a way to deter 
abuses against peaceful protesters and to enhance their protection. States must understand that there is no contradiction between the protection of human rights and the protection of national interests, as long as such a protection is guaranteed for all. My mandate has been focused on changing this perception of peaceful protest as threat to national security. I'm currently preparing a dedicated report for the Human Rights Council aimed at changing the narrative and highlighting the importance of peaceful protest to solve crises and strengthen democracy, maintain peace, and contribute to a sustainable peace. Thank you for your time and for listening to me, and I wish you success in today's conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bol, for that, what I would say, a heartfelt sharing on the freedom and the right to assembly, particularly in a time of a pandemic. Uh, we often forget about violations against civil society, human rights defenders, and friends of the media, including journalists, by heavy-handed approaches by iron-fisted regimes. Or worse, just in case anyone was going to doze off or plan to have a short nap, that was the little bit of a, yeah, a wake up <laughs> Um uh, or worse, democratic establishments that allow itself to fall prey to those within them who force governments to make fatal decisions on democracy. Uh, it's interesting, he noted also that governments cannot solve uh, this uh, threat of violations against the right to free assembly alone uh, and must stop looking at CSOs as their enemy, but as formidable partners. Um, I found it very interesting that uh, he put the protection of national interests on the same platform as the protection of human rights. And with that, uh, being a lawmaker in Malaysia, um, the scenario in Myanmar is exactly what um, uh, Honorable Bol uh, was sharing about. The right to free assembly, the right to association, the right to, to voice out dissatisfaction or dissent against the junta uh, military had been met with extreme, extreme uh, reaction. Um, you know, we have so many young people, students who have lost their lives uh, standing up for what they believe in, in democracy, in freedom and equality, and most importantly, uh, for a free and democratic Myanmar. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I, I thank very much uh, Mr. Bo for his uh, sharing. Uh, we move on to the second panelist. Uh, next, we have a presentation uh, by my dear parliamentary colleague, Honorable Esther Cuesta. Honorable Cuesta is the president of the Parliamentary Group for the Rights of People in Human Mobility of the National Assembly of Ecuador. She is also the chairperson of the PGA Ecuador National Group. She will now share her testimony on the situation in Ecuador and the attacks against women parliamentarians and women's rights defenders. Dear Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kashturi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Eh, buenos días a los participantes del 42 segundo Foro Anual de Parlamentarios para la Acción Global. Un gusto estar aquí. Estos espacios nos permiten intercambiar reflexiones sobre la situación del Estado de Derecho, la democracia, la equidad de género y el respeto a los derechos humanos en nuestros países. Así como también los riesgos que tenemos cada vez eh, que se incrementan para nosotros los legisladores en un contexto, si podríamos llamarlo, cada vez más sofisticadamente violento y regresivo en derechos. Antes de empezar con un análisis sobre la violencia política de género y el lawfare o judicialización de la política en Ecuador, quisiera compartir con ustedes un video. Eh, veamos si puedo hacerlo. Share screen. A ver, un ratito. Ajá, ahí. ¿Lo vemos? No, not yet, uh, Esther. It's not yet. Not visible. yet. Oh. A ver, un ratito. 
Perdón, un ratito. Okay. Now, yes. Ahora sí, perdón. Now it's, it's without audio. We can, we can watch it, but we cannot hear the uh, sound. Maybe I would, I would propose to Esther to continue her presentation as maybe the sound is not available, but we can see these very graphic images of aggressive talk and uh, also in the social media now. Okay, um, so these, ah, perdón, estas imágenes violentas, misóginas, racistas, hablan de la presidenta de la Asamblea Nacional, eh, dan una idea también de lo que vivimos las mujeres que hacemos política en el Ecuador. Por un lado, existe la violencia política de género, que es parte de la violencia estructural de la sociedad patriarcal, eh, que se manifiesta en contra de las mujeres en ámbitos público y privado, y por otra parte, la persecución y hostigamiento político, jurídico y mediático en contra de las mujeres políticas que representamos una posición de oposición al gobierno. Eso es parte de lo que conocemos como lawfare o guerra judicial concebida y utilizada por grupos de poder político, económico, y que es parte de estrategias geopolíticas en nuestra región. Según cifras del Instituto Nacional de Estadísticas y Censos, institución que maneja cifras oficiales, 61 de cada 100 mujeres en Ecuador han sido víctimas de algún tipo de violencia a lo largo de su vida. Por otra parte, 172 mujeres y niñas fueron asesinadas en Ecuador entre enero y noviembre de este año por su condición de mujeres y niñas. Respecto a la violencia política de género, ONU Mujeres reporta en un estudio del 2019 que 56 de cada 100 mujeres que ganaron en las urnas un cargo de elección popular fueron víctimas de difamación y difusión de injurias en redes sociales. Estamos hablando que más de la mitad de mujeres que fueron elegidas por voto popular han recibido estos ataques. En este contexto, quiero también hacer notar la exclusión de la participación de las mujeres en la actual coyuntura estatal y en los diferentes niveles de gobierno local como una muestra de la historia y discriminación estructural contra las mujeres. En el gobierno actual, de las 31 instituciones del Ejecutivo, ministerios y secretarías, solo 6 están lideradas por mujeres y 25 por hombres. Es decir, el 81% de las máximas autoridades que planifican e implementan y asignan presupuesto a las políticas públicas en el Ecuador son hombres. De las 23 gobernaciones designadas por el presidente de la República, 19 son gobernadores y solo 4 gobernadoras. De las 203 alcaldías, solo hay 18 alcaldesas, es decir, el 8%, y de las 23 prefecturas, solo hay cuatro prefectas, es decir, el 17%. El Parlamento, como sabemos, un cuerpo colegiado donde el liderazgo es menos acentuado sobre una sola persona, tenemos la tercera mujer presidenta del Parlamento y por primera vez en la historia del Ecuador una persona amazónica preside el Parlamento ecuatoriano. Pero aún no alcanzamos una equidad total de género. De los 137 asambleístas, 52 son mujeres y 85 son hombres. Es decir, el 62% de legisladores son hombres. Y en cuanto a las presidencias de comisiones, 81 están lideradas por hombres y 19 por mujeres, es decir, de las 13 comisiones, eh, solamente 3 hay mujeres. Y, perdón, y 13 son dirigidas por hombres. La Corte Nacional de Justicia está conformada por 21 jueces, de los cuales 16 son hombres y 5 mujeres. Es decir, el 76% son hombres y 24% mujeres. El Consejo Nacional de la Judicatura tiene cinco consejeros, tres hombres y dos mujeres. La Corte Constitucional, compuesta por nueve jueces, cinco hombres y cuatro mujeres. No hay instancia nacional de justicia en el Ecuador donde las mujeres seamos mayoría 
o tengamos al menos el mismo porcentaje de participación. Como lo mencionaba al inicio, de manera frecuente la violencia y discriminación política de género en Ecuador se vincula con el lawfare, lo que entendemos como el uso indebido de instrumentos jurídicos para fines de persecución política, destrucción de imagen pública e inhabilitación de un adversario político. Aquí la prensa hegemónica juega un papel fundamental, combinando acciones aparentemente legales, que son realmente acciones antijurídicas, con una amplia cobertura para presionar a jueces, mientras que los opositores políticos son juzgados mediáticamente antes de ser juzgados en tribunales. El lawfare, junto a la violencia política de género, constituye un agresivo cóctel en el escenario de la política, lo que podríamos llamar el lawfare de género. En Ecuador, como en algunos países de América Latina, la aplicación de esta fórmula de persecución y hostigamiento es aplicada para atacar a mujeres políticas, que de forma radical y consciente se han opuesto a los gobiernos de turno o gobiernos o grupos de poder político, mediático y económico. Un ejemplo claro es el relacionado con Paola Pavón, prefecta de la provincia de Pichincha y ex legisladora, quien luego de las movilizaciones sociales de octubre del 2019 fue víctima de persecución política por su militancia en un partido de oposición al gobierno y fue privada de libertad por 71 días, vulnerando sus derechos procesales al punto que la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos emitió medidas cautelares a su favor junto a otros compañeros detenidos y su proceso aún continúa. La ex legisladora Soledad Buendía narra en su artículo Lawfare y violencia política contra las mujeres, escrito desde el asilo en México en 2019, el testimonio de cómo el lawfare toma una forma particular contra las mujeres por el hecho de ser políticas, que más allá de la discriminación contra las mujeres, hay un ensañamiento en el uso de la violencia contra ellas que incluye la misoginia con expresiones sexistas, discriminatorias, degradantes, descalificadoras, que invisibiliza el protagonismo y liderazgo de las mujeres con el fin de menoscabar su imagen pública y sus derechos políticos. Así, por ejemplo, las ex parlamentarias Doris Solís y Marcela Guiñaga y la parlamentaria Pamela Aguirre, aquí presente, han sido acosadas y hostigadas por la Contraloría y Fiscalía General del Estado, incluso durante el embarazo y lactancia materna. Y las ex parlamentarias Aguiñaga, Gabriela Rivadeneira y Marcelo Olguín enfrentaron un proceso de indagación previa en la Fiscalía General del Estado por un supuesto delito de, de instigación a consecuencia del de paro nacional de octubre del 2019. Estas acciones intentan amedrentarnos, que tengamos miedo para inmovilizarnos políticamente. Los ataques mediáticos, editoriales y noticias de migrantes en contra de las mujeres políticas han sido múltiples, sistemáticos y coordinados. Las noticias falsas y las difamaciones en redes sociales y en los medios de comunicación públicos y privados llegaron a violencia de tipo sexual, incluso con videos pornográficos. Los testimonios de parlamentarias y ex parlamentarias nos señalan que hay un incremento progresivo de la violencia que muchas veces inicia con memes que pueden parecer chistosos, que van increciendo con ataques en medios de comunicación por su condición de mujeres, por su militancia política progresista, llegando al enjuiciamiento, encarcelamiento y hasta el exilio. Habría que analizar más a fondo y desde una perspectiva de género hechos como los acontecidos durante el periodo legislativo anterior en Ecuador cuando se destituyó a seis asambleístas, primero a las tres mujeres, una de las cuales fue un claro ejemplo de law fair, Sofía Spin, que fue incluso reelegida en las últimas elecciones parlamentarias. Y luego a tres hombres, de los cuales se lo destituyó uno cuando ya estaba privado de libertad, el otro cuando ya estaba prófugo de la justicia, y el tercero fue destituido a 72 horas que concluya su periodo legislativo. Y esto pues... Sin, sin nombrar las tres mujeres parlamentarias y un parlamentario que solicitaron asilo en México durante el periodo legislativo anterior. Ahora observamos en el Ecuador una nueva ola de lawfare de género. Varias legisladoras han sido víctimas de violencia de género en el Pleno de la Asamblea Nacional y de acoso violento a través de redes sociales por manifestarse abiertamente en oposición al gobierno, por fiscalizar la gestión gubernamental o por pedir explicaciones sobre, sobre la vinculación del presidente de la República en el caso conocido como Pandora Papers, que asocia a políticos, funcionarios públicos y multimillonarios 
y cuyos bienes se encontrarían en paraísos fiscales. En septiembre de este año, la asambleísta Luisa González hizo público diversos ataques de género que recibió por participar en política. Ella afirmaba en su cuenta de Twitter, cito, nos castigan por ser mujeres y además por atrevernos a hacernos a hacer política. Y mencionó los múltiples ataques eh, que recibió por participar en política, como por ejemplo, la segunda mujer de Correa, refiriéndose al expresidente Rafael Correa, zorra, miseria humana, amante de Correa, y afirmaba con mucho acierto que cuando una mujer sobresale políticamente, empiezan los ataques de carácter sexual. Quiero regresar a las investigaciones del caso Pandora Papers. La legisladora Mónica Palacios, junto a otros militantes del movimiento de oposición UNES, ofrecieron una rueda de prensa mencionada sobre este caso, lo que ocasionó una agresiva reacción de los grandes medios de comunicación. En ese contexto, el asambleísta Diego Ordóñez, del Partido Gobernista, a través de su cuenta de Twitter, afirmó, refiriéndose al asambleísta Palacios, que, cito, pasar del tubo a la curul y surgen estas argucias torpes. Termino la cita. ¿Qué significa esto? Que él trató de minimizar su accionar al, as al, ac al asociarla como una mujer que baila en un tubo, que baila en un strip club, mientras circulaba en WhatsApp un video supuestamente sens sensual y sexual de ella para menoscabar la seria fiscalización que realizaba al presidente de la República desde su rol como parlamentaria y la propia legalidad de la condición de presidente de, del señor Lazo, pues la ley ecuatoriana prohíbe a funcionarios públicos tener capitales en paraísos fiscales. La asambleísta Palacios presentó una queja y el legislador eh, Ordóñez fue sancionado por el Consejo de Administración Legislativa con 15 días sin remuneración, sanción que cumplirá el próximo mes. En este mismo escenario de los Pandora Papers y como parte del lawfare de género, un histórico aliado del presidente de la República y ex asambleísta y ex candidato presidencia, vicepresidencial Andrés Páez, el 9 de noviembre pasado solicitó con el carácter de urgente el inicio de una indagación fiscal en contra de los miembros de la Comisión Legislativa de Derechos Humanos por el supuesto delito de falsedad ideológica del informe relativo a los Pandora Papers. Es decir, que dicho informe tiene un contenido falso que se pretende afirmar como verdadero. Y aquí debo recordar que tres mujeres políticas, parte del movimiento de oposición UNES, son miembros de la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. Paola Cabezas, Victoria de Sintonio y Fernanda Estudillo. La Fiscalía General del Estado inició una indagación previa por el supuesto delito de falsedad ideológica, desconociendo expresas disposiciones constitucionales y de la ley de la función legislativa que establecen la inmunidad parlamentaria. Esta actuación pone en riesgo la democracia, las competencias parlamentarias, de control político y el equilibrio y contrapeso en el poder público. Frente a este escenario, tenemos múltiples desafíos. Necesitamos impulsar procesos sistemáticos de capacitación y formación en temas de violencia de género en todo el sector público y fortalecer desde la legislación la obligación de todas las instituciones públicas de todos los niveles de gobierno, especialmente en el ámbito judicial, para que los funcionarios no solamente sean capacitados, sino evaluados en este proceso. Por otra parte, la Asamblea Nacional aún no cuenta con un protocolo para la prevención de acoso sexual y acoso laboral con connotación sexual establecido en la Ley de la Función Legislativa. Es una tarea pendiente y creo que el Código Parlamentario Global de Conducta Democrática de PGA es una gran iniciativa que nos ayuda. Es fundamental que las mujeres políticas impulsemos casos emblemáticos de violencia política de género ante instancias administrativas, judiciales e internacionales. Debemos demandar reparación integral que obligue a los estados a tomar medidas de orden estructural para transformar la cultura y las prácticas de odio, discriminación y violencia. La política de género y el lawfare de género socava la democracia y la deja vacía desde adentro de su concreto significado en la vida cotidiana de las personas, como cuando se excava la tierra desde abajo durante la minería ilegal y luego las casas colapsan, como sucede hoy en el sur del Ecuador, en Saruma. Así, colapsaría la democracia si dejamos que esta violencia siga intensificando. Por ello, debemos denunciarla y combatirla. Gracias.
Thank you very much, uh, Esther, for that um, very important sharing. Uh, and this right after the uh, 16 day of activism of uh, violence against women uh, celebration uh, all over the world. Um, I, uh, you, you raised a lot of very pertinent points and particularly uh, on the situation that's going on in uh, uh, Ecuador and uh, our solidarity and support with you and all the other female lawmakers and human rights defenders there who are still battling and struggling in a misogynistic, in a, in a um, uh, discriminatory uh, environment. Uh, and I hope that uh, this would open the eyes of uh, uh, governments and, and other lawmakers who are here with us today uh, to urge uh, their governments, to urge their parliaments uh, to sit up and take note uh, that uh, women who make up more than half of the world's population are the ones who are at the end of the, the um, you know, treated badly, treated like, like second class citizens and worse in other countries uh, where you have um, civil laws and religious laws in, entwining and uh, that that brings about more discrimination and pressure uh, uh, for women. Um, it, uh, it is, it's terrible to hear about women being assassinated, uh, uh, murdered uh, at this time and age. And it's something that you thought you would only have heard uh, when you were a child growing up and it's still happening today. And it is something that is extremely important for all of us to take note of. And just because if it doesn't happen in our countries, it just because it doesn't happen in our parliaments, it doesn't mean that we don't intervene and urge other parliaments and other governments to move in the right direction and to do what is right. Um, I particularly liked uh, uh, what you said about the threat of uh, uh, progressive women to conservative and uh, misogynistic uh, governments. And I think many, many of the female lawmakers here can attest to that if they come from uh, societies or governments that that have taken a very long time to acknowledge the presence of women or for the voices of women to be heard in their national assemblies and parliament. Um, I, I look forward to hearing questions uh, uh, for uh, regarding uh, the rights of women and protection for women, women parliamentarians. But before that, uh, may I request everyone to switch on your cameras uh, for us to take a group photo. Um, yeah, can we, can we all do that? before we move on to the, the next speaker. Thank you, thank you. I ask uh, the colleagues to let us know when the picture is taken so we can move forward. I see Daniel noting. Honorable. May I take it that we are all on video now? I see. That's okay. David, have, have, have I been captured? Okay, wonderful. I see Honorable Rosina in the night of Maldives. <laughs> wonderful. Perfect. I think we can we can move forward. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope I'm I hope I'm visible. Yes, we saw you. That was Millie, right? <laughs> yes, we did. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Esther. Uh, we will now give the floor to Dr. Tom Daly, who is the Deputy Director of the University of Melbourne School of Government and the Director of the Platforms Democratic Decay and Renewal. Uh, DMDEC and the COVID DEM. It is my understanding that it is past midnight in Melbourne. Sincere thanks, Dr. Delhi, for being here with us to talk about the potential effects of the recession of American and European leadership on democracies and autocratic regimes. Dr. Delhi, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here, even though it is late. So uh, good morning, good day, and, and good night to all of you, wherever you are. And thank you to the PGA for inviting me to this important event. I'm honored to be here. And thank you to the House of Representatives of Belize for hosting us. I've been connected with the PGA for a number of years now, and I'm always eager to collaborate uh, with you as really 
committed democratic leaders. So I've been asked to talk to the question, has the recession of American and European leadership weakened democracies and emboldened autocratic regimes? And I should say that, you know, my team and I have been tracking COVID's impact on democracies and autocracies worldwide since April 2020 through our online COVID Dem global uh, democracy and pandemic tracker. Um, so we look at things like emergency measures, rights restrictions, power grabs, and we look at the good news too. Um, and you can see the URL there in the corner of my background if you want to check out uh, COVID Dem. Um, so when we think about the starting point when the pandemic hit, you know, if global democracy was a patient itself, it was already quite ill when the UN declared a global health emergency two years now in January uh, 2020. And our esteemed chair and a number of the speakers have already spoken to the context that was there uh, as COVID hit. You know, we had a 15 year trend of democratic recession. We had new forms of a liberal and authoritarian government democratically elected, but hollowing out the democratic system through diminishing courts, parliaments, the media, manipulating elections and so on. And more broadly, by the time COVID hit, democracies, even when they didn't have that type of government, were struggling to deal with intensifying challenges of hyperpolarization, political fragmentation, growing economic inequality, um, and the lingering effects of the global financial crisis. You have disengaged and distrustful electorates, you have a distorted and fractured information landscape, not only due to social media, but also political misbehavior. Um, and that was all hollowing out the shared reality and trust fundamental to any democratic society. And as we know, you know, de democracies were all facing also a reshaped geopolitical environment um, with the rapid rise of China, especially as an authoritarian superpower and the increasing employment of sharp power uh, by liberal governments against liberal um, democracies. And then the pandemic hit. So when we think of the immediate effects, it's still staggering to think about COVID's immediate and unprecedented impact on democratic systems worldwide. You know, by April 2020, an unprecedented number of states, counting for over half of the world, um, simultaneously declared a state of emergency or introduced emergency measures without a formal emergency declaration. Over 50 states postponed elections with often little certainty as to when and how they would be held. Um, with governments assuming, as we know, sweeping powers, citizens had to submit to rights restrictions, stay at home orders, expanded police powers and surveillance apps, you name it. Um, and this was often without anything, especially in the early days, without anything close to an acceptable level of democratic scrutiny because of how uh, parliaments and other institutions like the media were hobbled by the early days of, um, of COVID. So in April 2020, for example, it was estimated that across 18 countries alone, um, suspensions or uh, restrictions of parliament affected about 2 billion people. Um, and that's what, you know, we see in common, democracies having in common across the world. But if you take the world as a whole, I divide sort of democratic responses into a number of categories. And I want to talk about those quickly. So I call the first category the rationalists. This is where governments address the pandemic through rational fact-based policy. They acted within the constraints of the law and they place clear limitations on emergency measures to keep as much of the democratic system functioning as possible. So countries like Australia were admired for, you know, getting to COVID zero and some return to normality while respecting the rule of law, at least in 2020. Um, but you see all these democratic deficiencies in the Australian pandemic response, even though it was seen as a something like a gold standard response. So you have the sidelining of parliaments across the Federation, partly due to a failure to explore alternative means of sitting, like hybrid arrangements with in-person and remote mixed, um, as we saw in the UK and Canada. We've excessive reliance on executive lawmaking with weak oversight and insufficient attention to the impact of COVID measures on minorities. So really reflecting who's sitting around the table when decisions are being made, especially where measures are disproportionate. Um, and the sidelining of parliament seems to reveal a wrongheaded view that rather than a broad based institutional response to um, COVID, a command and control action through executive led responses was the only viable way to address the crisis, especially a crisis of the scale and magnitude of the pandemic. Um, the second category is fantasists. Um, 
I had to include that 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 category because the US and the and Brazil fit in there. So this includes governments whose immediate response was impeded and distorted by partial or full denial of the facts presented by the experts and engagement in conspiracy theories. So, you know, the Trump administration's COVID response throughout 2020, as we know, with hundreds of thousands of fatalities and chaotic federal state coordination, it provided an easy target for authoritarian states to boast about their superior virus responses and to denigrate democracies as decadent failures. Um, but we also see how the US abruptly changed tack with the change of government. Um, broadly landing in sort of more the rationalist camp, the first category I mentioned. Um, and the actions taken to more fully address COVID are as much down to Congress as they were to the new president. So in Brazil too, you know, Congress has acted to constrain the president's worst excesses and sought to hold him to account. The third category I think is the category get category that most of us are really concerned about in many ways. It's the autocratic opportunists, as I call them. So this is where you already had clear trends of democratic decay in place before COVID hit and had already been progressing for years. And governments seemed to recognize the reality the reality of the threat. So unlike the fantasists, they recognized there was a public health emergency, but they pounced on it to expand and consolidate their power. So Hungary here is the poster child. You know, the parliament acted quickly to empower the prime minister to rule by decree, setting no time limit on the emergency measures and arming the government with a new law criminalizing publication of false or distorted facts. And this was just the latest, latest step in a long line of measures disempowering parliament in a process of democratic decay that has been very weakly confronted by the EU. And that has really weakened the EU's standing as a democratic bloc and its standing in terms of being able to um, be a voice for democracy outside of Europe. Um, if we look outside of Europe, you know, India, India's pandemic response was hugely affected by executive domination of the policy making process as well, a distaste for dis dissent, and you had federal parliament not sitting for six month stretches on end. Um, and that, that's not even mentioning worldwide, you know, the abuses of law, repression of protests and criticism that Mr. Vool spoke about in his presentation. So wherever we turn, you know, parliaments um, are key. And the pandemic has underlined how central they are to good governance and to crisis governance. Um, and there's a sense that the crisis has consumed everyone's attention. And that's allowed a lot of these kinds of issues to go unchallenged or barely noticed in the international arena. Um, if we move over to the fully authoritarian side, you know, in my mind, in terms of both geopolitical and symbolic importance, what's been most striking is how the Chinese government very quickly after COVID rolled out a series of measures to really reduce um, Hong Kong's freedoms. So this includes draconian national security legislation and changing the electoral system to effectively ban pro-democracy candidates from uh, contestation for the National Assembly. Um, and elections under this so-called Patriots only system were held just a few months ago. And they've really underlined just how much Hong Kong now operates much more like the mainland. And so where we were all worried at the time of the handover in 1997 about the sustainability of the one country, two systems model, um, those worries have come to pass. You know, Hong Kong is no longer free um, or at least anything like as free as it was. And we've tens of thousands of people leaving as a result. And could that have happened without the combination of an internally weakened USA, an internally sort of distracted EU and a globally weakened UK with Brexit? I really doubt it. Um, at the geopolitical level as well, you know, authoritarian governments expanded their anti-democratic propaganda throughout the pandemic. Um, the European Commission produced a report in June 2020 concluding that Russia and China were behind a whole load of online narratives um, that were not clearly marked as government narratives. Um, and we see the effects of these campaigns, you know, and conspiracy theories and far right propaganda on our streets. You know, it's visible on our streets with anti-vaccination protests and so on, which often drown out reasonable concerns about executive overreach and about the normalization of emergency measures. Um, now, usually at this point, you know, my audience is so depressed that they just want me to stop talking. So I'm going to give you some of the good news. And this is one of the reasons why we set up COVID Dems to try and look at where are the bright spots? I mean, Professor Carruthers talked about the bright spots of women's participation. There are other bright spots. So one is we now have a lot of global data 
on who has done well in terms of responding to the to the COVID crisis. And what it's told us is that autocracies aren't better at crisis response. Actually, neither liberal democracies nor autocracies are better. It's actually um, there's no simple division between between them. It depends on you know multiple fault lines based on state capacity, effective government governance based on observable fact and citizen trust in government. So it's really un undermined that, that authoritarian narrative that democracies are ineffective, they're slow, they're decadent, they're unable to do anything. We've also been pushed into reforming how we conduct elections. So we saw these sweeping changes made to the conduct of elections with special voting arrangements like early postal and proxy voting becoming more common. In South Korea, you know, one of the first countries to actually organize national parliamentary elections after COVID hit in April 2020, you saw candidates making this unprecedented shift to digital campaigning. Um, and they achieved the highest turnout since 1992 with 66% of eligible voters. Um, globally, we see also developments that have improved voter turnout and inclusiveness include a 60% increase in advanced voting in New Zealand. Um, you see drive-through voting in the Czech Republic and you see the extension of absentee voting arrangements for specific groups being given to the entire public in US states like Michigan. Um, the next question I think for us is whether and how these innovations will be retained or modified after the crisis ends or the immediate sort of yeah. um, oh. or whether you know there will be a backlash to try and actually put the genie back in the bottle and um, the third one i want to see i want to quickly talk about is just hybrid parliaments because they present a, a, an example of go how government institutions can be transformed very quickly. It's striking how the UK Parliament, such an old parliament, was able to rethink how it worked, you know, trialing a new hybrid system, mixing in-person and remote attendance. And then we saw that sort of being uh, spreading elsewhere. Um, and observers, you know, researchers actually following what was happening in Parliament, in the hybrid version of Parliament, reported interesting results. So you have less booing and jeering during Prime Minister's questions. You have greater focus on the substance of debates. You have MPs being able to spend more time in their constituencies. And importantly, more contributions from female MPs. Um, so that model, you know, was adopted in other places. But like the election reforms, there has been a snapback as soon as you know parliaments could go back to the old ways they did and i think we're still in a moment trying to struggle can we make better use of hybrid without sort of um letting it take over the final thing i just want to talk talk about is from the academic side you know i am based in in academia despite also doing a lot of policy work and i see researchers seeing parliaments with new eyes and with new energy and with new enthusiasm so it's electrified researchers and we see a lot of research coming out now on the importance of parliament on reforming parliament on achieving more inclusive parliaments on beefing up parliament's role in future pandemic responses and rebalancing overall away from the decades long trend of executive dominance, which has really diminished parliament's role overall. And I think that's where the US and EU can really find a leadership role in the contemporary world, you know, and perhaps some of the initiatives coming out of the Summit for Democracy can hopefully help with that. Um, but COVID reminds us that it's not just about American and European leadership. When we think about all the countries I've just mentioned, you know, leadership can be found anywhere. It can be found everywhere. And that's just one more reason why we try to track all of this through the COVID Dem um, database. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you again for inviting me. Really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Delhi, for your sharing. And uh, uh, my biggest takeaway from what you shared was um, that the devil is always in the details and it's all about data. Uh, thank you for all the good work that you've done over the past one year to collect data, to crunch numbers, so that you can share this with us, um, those who are from the academic world, those who are lawmakers, our civil society friends and journalists, so that the narrative can be framed rightfully and properly when we speak about democracy, when we speak about good governance, uh, and when we speak about the threat to democracy. Uh, and having said that, it was interesting, you mentioned 50 states postponed their elections. Uh, it's interesting also because Malaysia was one of the countries that um, went through a period of uh, emergency. 
but it wasn't because of COVID that uh, emergency was called. It was for political survival or for lack of a better word, maybe political stability. Um, we had a change of prime minister over the past two, more, slightly more than two years, which is really quite embarrassing um, because not only did we have to deal with the health crisis and the economic crisis because of COVID, but we also had to deal with a terrible political crisis as well. So thank you very much um, for sharing and also to highlight that apart from the politics of America and politics of Europe is also the politics of the rest of the world and uh, looking at what's going on in, in the ASEAN region as well, um, where sometimes news doesn't really make it on, on, on major news portals. Um, but you know, uh, injustice uh, anywhere is injustice everywhere. So uh, thank you again. And I, I look forward to hearing your sharing through the questions that are gonna be posed uh, after this. We're running a little bit out of time, um, but we do have time for uh, one of the persons that I look forward to hearing, uh, Honorable Anita uh, Vandenbelt, uh, who is she's a member of the House of Commons and founding member of the PGA Parliamentary Response Team part. Over the past years, uh, we have witnessed how social media platforms have become a tool for governments, interest groups and individuals to, to disseminate propaganda and incite violence and compromise the integrity of the electoral process. Honorable Vandenbelt will speak about her experience and her observation on the impact of social media on established liberal democracies and on regimes charting a path towards democracy. Honorable Vandenbelt, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a real honor to be able to be here uh, at the 42nd Assembly of uh, Parliamentarians for Global Action, uh, and also with the uh, the other panelists, uh, the in incredible cross sharing of information that we're able to do today. Um, thank you for the question about social media uh, and the rise of authoritarianism and undermining of democracies, uh, because as we've seen, uh, because of social media, those, those geographic boundaries uh, particularly when it comes to foreign interference, uh, are starting to, to blend. And this is something that has happened around the world. Uh, so, so thank you very much for, for having me. I'd like to talk a little bit, I've been asked to talk about the Canadian experience and how parliamentarians in Canada specifically have been dealing with this issue. Uh, and there's four areas that I'd like to address. Uh, first of all, of course, the work that parliamentary committees have been able to do in Canada. Uh, second of all, the way in which we have been able to work internationally, because we know that uh, this is a problem that is global and the connections that parliamentarians can make with one another, not least of which today is an example. Uh, third is legislation and uh, fourth is citizen engagement. Uh, we have seen in Canada at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were studies that showed that 90% of Canadians were getting their information about the pandemic, about COVID-19 online. And when they did a study, 40% of Canadians said that later on, they found out that information that they thought was true turned out not to be true. And I suspect that number is probably quite a bit higher. Uh, so this is, this is a serious problem that's aggravated by the pandemic but it's not a new problem. And uh, we know that uh, certainly in Canada, our proximity to the US and the UK uh, made us quite uh, aware of this, particularly after the 2016 election in the US and, uh, and after Brexit. And so our parliamentary committees uh, started working on this in 2018. I was a member of the Privacy Information and Ethics Committee that decided to, to undertake a study into what was then the, the scandal of Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, which is I think the first time that this really reached the public imaginary in, in our country at least, uh, that, that this was a serious problem. And one of the examples I'd like to share with you today is the way in which our committee was able to work with the UK committee that was doing a very similar study uh, on, on Brexit and the interference in Brexit uh, of the social media giants. And what happened was there was uh, Cambridge Analytica had a subsidiary in Canada, uh, Aggregate IQ, that a lot of the funding for the pro-Brexit movement was actually put through this Canadian subsidiary. And because it was offshore, the UK Parliament couldn't get documents or compel testimony. 
but we could in Canada. So we worked with them. We were able to bring them in, uh, compel testimony and documents, which we then were able to make public, which were then used by the UK committee uh, and also authorities in the UK to actually press charges. Uh, so, but it was even more than that because of the, the digital ability um, during the committee hearings, when we were actually questioning aggregate IQ, we actually, one of our committee members who was who knew the uh, the UK chair of the committee quite well was texting back and forth. And they were sitting with the UK information commissioner. And while we were questioning, they would give an answer and say, no, no, we didn't, uh, we didn't receive anything from the UK information commissioner. And we would get a text and our member would say, well, what about in April when the UK commissioner sent you this letter? And we were literally helping one another working uh, because they were watching our committee from the UK. So this ability to, if you could amplify this globally, because the problem is global. It is not something one individual country can solve. Um, and that's something that we saw later when Canada hosted the grant committee uh, on, on the same topic. And we had 17 legislators from 17 countries who came to Canada for two or three days of witnesses and committee hearings on these topics. And what we discovered, and I will never forget my conversation with uh, an MP from India, who, when we were talking in Canada about the fact that the Canadian market, really, when it comes to the social media giants, uh, our market is very small. So even if Canada were to regulate or legislate, uh, they can ignore us. And he said to me, they may be able to ignore Canada. They cannot ignore the Indian market. And the fact that we need to be working in conjunction with legislators to be able to put similar policies that can't be ignored by these transnational dataopolis. Um, there's other committees that have taken this on. The uh, Certainly the, the Subcommittee on International Human Rights has taken the opportunity to amplify the voices of people like Maria Ressa and others around the world and have them testify. Um, but the Status of Women Committee has also undertaken this issue of of online hate and online violence, particularly against women and girls. And when we brought some of the social media companies to, to testify, we really delved into algorithms. And what we learned is that the algorithms are, are created by largely young men. A lot of the IT uh, people uh, in these companies are young men and they're recreating the social biases of young men in these algorithms. So um, really trying to focus in on that. Um, but of course, beyond committee work, we've been able to do uh, quite a bit uh, in Canada as well on the legislative side. Um, first of all, I would say that having had these recommendations from committees, uh, it, it scared some of these social media giants into self-regulating out of fear that there would be legislation emerging. And so we were able to work with some of them um, before the 2019 election in Canada, there was a lot of concern after what had happened in the US and some of that was just starting to come to the fore uh, at that time. And so we worked with our, our government, worked with some of the social media companies and came up with the Canada Declaration on electoral online integrity. Uh, and there was a guide that was actually publicly endorsed by Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. But we know self-regulation is not enough. And we also passed legislation before the 2019 election about foreign interference. And one of the key aspects of the legislation was transparency, uh, making sure that these, these social media companies, if there were political advertisements, not just by parties, but also by, by third parties, uh, intended to influence the election during and before the election period, they had to register them. They had to keep a copy, but more importantly, also who authorized the ad. Now this has worked well with certain platforms like Facebook, both in 2019 and our recent election in 2021, uh, less so with Google, who decided again that the Canadian market wasn't worth it and just decided not to do political ads, which emphasizes once again, why we need to be working in conjunction with other jurisdictions so that we can have similar regulations on these transnational companies. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the things our government is doing uh, in terms of citizen, uh, citizen engagement and digital literacy. Uh, we created in 2019 a digital citizen initiative, and this is funding that is to build resiliency against some of the, the influence, which was 
very good timing because it came in just before COVID. And this is funding for digital literacy programs, critical thinking for youth and students in school, but also uh, NGOs and CSOs that are working on this area. Uh, also funding for research and for innovation in the sector. And I think this is something that, again, we can share best practices internationally. Um, I'd like to just leave with one, one final commentary, which is that how much of what we, how we view the social media and online world uh, through a very domestic lens, uh, it, it is so context driven. So for instance, we are looking right now in Canada, we tabled legislation before the 2021 election and are potentially looking at tabling legislation again about online hate uh, to make changes to our criminal code. And from forums like this, and I would be very interested to hear from, from other countries about this, because from forums like this, it is predicated on an assumption uh, that Canadians have that our government is benevolent, uh, that the government can be the fair intermediary uh, of these things, and also that we have a fair and, uh, and, and a human rights driven judicial system. But I also know that in some countries, it is the, the governments and the judicial system that have been using legislation like this about online hate or uh, criminalizing online behavior in order to work against human rights defenders. And so this is a very, uh, I think, an area that we really need to do more as, as parliamentarians around the world with one another to try to make sure that we are not uh, legislating in one context that could actually fall into traps that of things that have happened uh, in other places. So uh, I'm, I'm very pleased today that, uh, that I was able to share some of these things. I know that every single one of us, particularly the women, uh, even here in Canada, have been subject to some of this, uh, this toxic environment online. Uh, and I really think that this is an area that we need to uh, cooperate. So thank you very much to PGA for hosting this important panel. And uh, I look forward to comments from others. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vandenberg, for that uh, very important uh, and pertinent sharing on the role of social media and how, apart from dealing with uh, the pandemic, we had to deal with misinformation and uh, emotional arguments on democracy, on vaccination, on the access to healthcare, etc. Um, I do have one question by Honorable Angela Brownberg, MP from Jamaica, but I see David has his hand up. Uh, he has raised his hand. Should Just to signal that Honorable Brown Burke wanted to speak. And also maybe if I can recall to everyone that this program of today is, is conducted thanks to the generous support of Global Affairs Canada. So I, I wanted to do this after Anita's presentation because I think there is no better thing than recognize the leadership of Canada in this field. Uh, after that, she would have done so. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Angela Brownberg, the floor is yours. We don't have much time. If you could keep your questions short, uh, and then maybe we could cover more questions within these five minutes that we have for Q&A. Go ahead. Honorable Angela? Maybe we'll wait for her to come back. Any more questions? Okay, it looks like everyone have uh, been fed with a lot of information. So perhaps a lot of homework to do after this. There is a uh, request from Honorable Narend Singh, I believe from India, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, very well. Uh, the, floor, the floor is yours, sir. Honorable C. Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, well, I, I can say good afternoon, everybody. I'm from South Africa, a member of parliament here in South Africa. And as you can see, I'm out in the wild. We are at a parliamentary workshop at the moment, so I might get cut off. Uh, I did hear some of your earlier speakers, but uh, 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 talking about COVID and how parliaments managed during the COVID uh, pandemic. But in South Africa, we also tried to use a hybrid system, which worked pretty well uh, in the circumstances. But I think one of the challenges that we had was the question of uh, uh, voting. 
you know, how, because during the session this year, we had to have a vote for a new speaker. And when a speaker of parliament is elected, you have to do it by secret ballot. So we all had to get to uh, parliament in Cape Town to uh, participate in that vote. And I wonder if there's any experiences from other countries that use a hybrid system on how you could have secret voting on a hybrid system. Uh, it, 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 we are trying to develop some system, but perhaps there are some examples that we could use. But otherwise, things going pretty well in South Africa. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, also the first time that the during the recent local government elections that the ruling party for 27 years uh, lost ground and went below 50 percent. And an interesting development here in our country is the whole issue of coalitions. It started at a local government level, but there's no doubt that come the next two years, there are also going to be coalitions at a, a national and provincial level. So I just thought if somebody could share some of their experiences with us, uh, I'll appreciate that. Thank you. If I may. If I may. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, um, so this, so we actually have a hybrid parliament in Canada, and uh, fortunately, because uh, we were able to renew it this session, um, and now with the cases going up in Canada, uh, we were all sitting in the House, uh, 338 of us, two weeks ago, and today we are mostly virtual again, but we have a voting app. This is what it looks like. It is based on 3D facial recognition. It's on a secure server on a phone that is dedicated, and uh, I'm sure if you look into the Canadian voting app, essentially if there were a vote right now it would come up i would be able to look at it do my 3d facial recognition vote and then you'd see in the house we have a screen you would see the votes going across with yay or nay and how each member voted and you can do this in conjunction with those that are in the house who are doing the standing vote at the same time so i'm happy to share that with anybody else uh, but the other advantage of our hybrid parliament is i'm on house duty at 10 a.m uh, in just 10 minutes and normally i'd have to leave this to be able to walk to the chamber but i'm able to stay until one minute to 10 because uh, i'm able to just log on virtually Truly so, uh, but I'm happy to talk more about that in future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, Honorable Angela is back. If she's ready, we'll take her question now. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, it, it wasn't that much of a question. I, I was really very impressed with the uh, presentation from Dr. Daly um, about the impact on the in our parents and I wanted to just say that I don't know if others felt like I did that in our parliaments we were struggling that this was happening at a global level and so I wanted to thank him for that presentation because it is not that we are now happy to know that we are not alone but it's certainly change the perspectives we were grappling with. I mean, Jamaica is a country full of violence. So when it came to the states of emergencies, it was a difficult time for us as legislators, especially with the kind of majority we have. So I was just wondering what was going on and that we can look at it at a global level to see what others are doing as well. Thanks. Um, Thank you very much, Honorable Angela. Uh, David? Yes, Honorable Kwame, the chair of the Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee of Ghana, who joined recently, PJ, also uh, would like to take the floor. Honorable Kwame, it's, it's wonderful to see you. Right. Thank you, DJ. Um, I just want to share the hybrid system. Ghana has the hybrid system, and um, our parliament. We have uh, the parliament is 275 members and uh, we are equally divided. Two main political parties. One uh, has 137, the other has 137 with one independent candidate. Then we had to go to uh, and choose the, the speaker. And by our standing, uh, Others, we are, are supposed to choose the speaker through secret ballot. 
And uh, when uh, we're on the 7th of January, we decide some of us, some of the party members decided to actually show their vote, but other party also prevented. Eventually, when we did the secret voting, we had the opposition party member being elected as the speaker. So now in Ghana, we have the, the ruling party in government, I belong to the ruling party, but the opposition, we are equally divided in parliament and the independent candidate decided to do business with our side and that gave us the majority. So we are in the majority, but the speaker uh, is on the other side. It's a very beautiful thing and uh, we are living with it, but that makes our the voting system the 137 137 with one independent candidate makes it very tight so if there is any issue that we have uh we are divided on uh, political lines then it becomes very difficult three line whip nobody can travel anywhere and between today tomorrow and saturday we are going to experience another one from ghana thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Kwame. And uh, I thank all the speakers and the panelists who have for their very important sharing. Uh, at a time like this, with this uh, technology, it is, it is possible to meet up and listen to success stories, challenges, uh, and the way forward together. Uh, and uh, I think it is time for me to hand over the floor back to David. Thank you very much, everyone. Over to you, David. Thank you, Kasturi, and I just immediately give back the floor to the convener of the PGA uh, Democratic Renewal and Human Rights Campaign, which is uh, convening us today, Honorable uh, Rosaina Adam from the Maldives from, for the second panel. I just want to say that all the meaningful and impactful statements that you are making in the chat for example, I see our former president, Margarita Stolbizer from Argentina, sharing her thoughts in the chat. All these um, statements will be collected and published by PGA in the website of this forum. So nothing will be lost in these three and a half hours. And without further ado, I give the floor to Honorable Rosaina Adam in Male, Parliament of the Maldives. Rosaina. Uh, thank you, David. Can you hear my voice clearly? Very well. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my uh, distinct pleasure to be chairing the second panel of uh, the day's discussion. Uh, this panel is dedicated to the role of legislators in reclaiming their democratic space as the branch of government representing the people. Uh, for participants joining us just now, I would like to kindly remind you that interpretation in French and Spanish are available. Please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and choose the language you would like to listen to. Recent years have seen in my country, the Maldives and worldwide, a progressive deterioration in the integrity of political discourse, including a decline in the trustworthiness of information and a rise in dangerous speech that increases the risk of violence. In fact, quite recently in Maldives, there was an attack on the speaker of parliament, which nearly cost him his life which was uh, indirectly the result of head speech. Uh, to tackle this particular issue, PGA launched on 19th March, 2021, the second pillar of the Democratic Renewable and Human Rights Campaign, the Global Parliamentary Code of uh, Democratic Conduct. I congratulate PGA on this wonderful achievement. It was, uh, it's a really good piece of work. This code of conduct, uh, serves as a credible mechanism to hold parliamentarians accountable for their speech, commit themselves to demand a dialogue respectful of all and refrain from disinformation. Uh, the court, although it's not binding, is very comprehensive and includes specific recommendations, such as basing our political discourse on facts and evidence, refrain from spreading misinformation and disinformation, refraining from using threats, 
hate speech or inciting any form of violence and discrimination against any person or group of persons and support access to free and independent media with the assistance of a regulatory framework that applies equally to all media, including social media, whenever these tools are used for the exercise of civil and political rights. I seize this opportunity to invite all my colleagues, legislators to sign on to the code and abide by its principle. Uh, I have, I myself have already signed the code and I think it is a very useful to, uh, a tool to self-regulate ourselves. We also encourage all legislators here present to further disseminate the code with other colleagues in your own parliament and uh, interactions you have. Uh, the document is available for sign-on on the PGA website. The Secretariat will share the link to the document in English, French and Spanish in the chat. Once you sign the code, a confirmation email will be sent to you uh, to guarantee that this is coming from an official account. It may be possible that the confirmation may land in your spam folders, which uh, also happened to me. Therefore, uh, we invite you to double check it. Uh, <laughs> to make sure you finalize the process. I will now give the floor to someone who does not need an introduction and who has been a long-standing partner for PGA, Professor Erwin Kotler. Professor Kotler is the chairperson of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and is a special envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating antisemitism. Moreover, Professor Kotler is a member of the high level panel of legal experts on uh, media freedom and a former member of parliament and minister of justice, attorney general of Canada. Before giving the floor to Professor Kotler, allow me to express sincere appreciation uh, to Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights for its partnership with PGA on the democratic renewal and human rights campaign. And uh, our gratitude to the government of Canada for its unwavering support. Professor Kotler, the floor is yours to speak on what has been uh, done internationally to support uh, civilians in repressive regimes and how parliamentarians can further amplify the actions of the international community. Please go ahead. Thank you for those kind words of introduction and it is a real uh, pleasure and privilege to participate in this important and timely uh, international uh, Forum organized by the Parliamentarians for Global Action, which I've had a, a long involvement in. I'll share some of that in reference to the particular theme that I've been asked uh, to address, that what has been done internationally to support civilians in countries with repressive regimes, and how can Parliament amplify the actions of the international uh, community. A word, if I may, on uh, a, a personal backdrop, because it it, it frames um, my remarks. When I was 11 years old, my father took me uh, to Ottawa uh, to Parliament and looking up at the Parliament building, he said to me, son, this is Vox Populi. This is the voice of the people, which today that kind of remark might be greeted with a certain sense of cynicism. But at the time it had a real impact as my father then spoke to me of the role and responsibility of parliamentarians as trustees of the people, as guardians of the rule of law, of defenders of uh, democracy. And he was then to speak of me, and uh, so my mother, both of them of blessed uh, memory, he would speak to me that uh, the pursuit of justice, as he put it, was equal to all the other commandments combined. This, as he said, must be your life's credo. This must be that which you teach onto your children. But my mother, when she would hear my father saying these things, would say to me that if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your community and beyond and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. Otherwise, the pursuit of justice will remain a theoretical abstraction. And so as a result of these teachings of my parents and other <clears throat> mentors that I had, such as uh, Professor Elie Wiesel, former Nobel uh, Peace Laureate, I got involved 
in the two major human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century. The struggle against apartheid in South Africa and the struggle for human rights in the former uh, Soviet Union. And got involved as well in the political prisoners who represented the face, the identity of those two struggles. Nelson Mandela in South Africa, who endured 27 years in a South African prison to emerge to not only preside over the dismantling of apartheid, become the first president of the first democratic, egalitarian, non-racial South Africa. Second political uh, prisoner was Anatoly uh, Sharansky, who became a founder of the Helsinki Monitoring Group in the former uh, Soviet Union. That became a model for civilian engagement groups and the inspiration which they spoke of, a small group of people can transform the world, uh, showing the power of civic uh, involvement and civic uh, engagement. At the same time, as I was involved in these two, um, I would say historic struggles and had the privilege to do so, as I mentioned, because of those teachings of my parents, I also became involved uh, pro bono as a young law professor with the Association of Survivors of Nazi Oppression. And they became a looking glass for me to try to get a sense of understanding horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened, of the dangers of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity. And what I learned in that in involvement, that what made the Holocaust or the genocides that followed, uh, whether we talk about the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda or what happened in Darfur more recently, uh, the Rohingya and uh, mass atrocities targeting the Uyghurs, what made all these things so horrific were not only the horrors themselves. What made them so horrific is that all these mass atrocities and genocides were preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. And so it was then that when I became a member of parliament, elected in a by-election in November 1999, one of my first acts was to join parliamentarians from all parties uh, to table the first ever war crimes and crimes against humanity legislation in the uh, Canadian parliament. And that helped domesticate the recently adopted then Rome statute. And this connects me uh, so quickly and clearly in my early parliamentary career to the Parliamentarians for Global Action. As a result of that, I became the Canadian chair of Parliamentarians for Global Action, chaired the first ever uh, Parliamentary Consultative Assembly for an International uh, Criminal Court, had the pleasure then of working with David, uh, uh, who is already emerging as the luminary for the parliamentarians for a global action. And then in that involvement afterwards as Minister of Justice and Attorney General, initiated the first ever prosecution under this War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity Act against one of the uh, genocidaires uh, in uh, Rwanda. And that therefore became part of the combating of impunity in authoritarian regimes and the like. But what I'd like to do now for the second part of my presentation is to uh, share with you a number of case studies of my involvement as a parliamentarian and since, as the chair mentioned, as uh, international chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center uh, for Human Rights, in what I would call in one breath, if I may, the combating of the resurgent global authoritarianism, the backsliding of democracies, the assault on human rights, including the assault on media freedom, and political prisoners as a looking glass into these assaults and the role that parliamentarians can play in uh, that regard, which is the organizing theme of this panel. The first case study uh, that I want to mention is uh, Xi Jinping's at China, and I use that term to distinguish it from the people and publics in China, otherwise the targets of, of mass oppression. And as I learned as a parliamentarian where I was taking up the cases of uh, 
political uh, prisoners. The first political prisoner I took up as a parliamentarian happened to have been a colleague of mine at McGill University during my academic days as a law professor, Professor Kunlun Zhang, a Falun Gong practitioner who went to China in 2000 while engaged in uh, ex Falun Gong exercises. He was arrested, uh, tortured in detention, etc. And I then learned the value of establishing an all-party parliamentary group on behalf of a political prisoner, and where that all-party parliamentary group was able to be used as a looking glass uh, into the assaults on uh, human rights, in this case of the Falun Gong practitioner. But it continued afterwards, because what I appreciated when I was involved uh, as a parliamentarian and since, and, and what has been so disturbing to me, has been the manner in which Xi Jinping's China has emerged as a major threat to what we speak of as a rules-based uh, international order, and in fact has been engaged in what Xi Jinping has called uh, the, the five sins, and he has targeted those five sins. I'm speaking here of the mass atrocities targeting the Uyghurs, where the Canadian parliament became the first parliament in the world to determine that these mass atrocities are in fact acts constitute of genocide. The assault not only on the democracy movement in Hong Kong, but on democracy itself in Hong Kong, unfolding as we uh, meet in all its frontal assault. The third the persecution and prosecution of the uh, Falun Gong, which 22 years ago, the Chinese leadership spoke of the need to eradicate this spiritual meditation movement. The fourth, the repression of Tibet, and the fifth, the menacing of Taiwan. But what is not so well known is the fact that China imprisons more journalists than any country in the world, that it imprisons lawyers and human rights defenders who would represent them and the like. And so combating this resurgent global authoritarianism exemplified uh, by uh, the CCP in China has led to the formation uh, 18 months ago of the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China, which I regard as being in effect a game changer. I say a game changer because prior to that, China would bully the democracies one by one. Australia, Japan, Canada. But the formation of this Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China with which the PGA has worked, has helped to combat this asymmetrical bullying and has brought about a mobilization of the community of democracies underpinned by, uh, democ by parliamentarians in that regard, which has led, for example, to the first ever imposition of Magnitsky sanctions targeting senior officials involved in mass atrocities against the Uyghurs and the like. But this is a case study, the first case study of the resurgent global authoritarianism where parliamentarians have been able to play a very important role in combating it in Xi Jinping's China. And those aspects of parliamentary work that Anita Vanderbilt mentioned, parliamentary hearings, committees and the like, have all been underpinning uh, that work domestically as we've been involved in the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance internationally. The second case study is uh, Putin's Russia. I've had a long history, as I said, with uh, political prisoners in the former uh, Soviet uh, Union. But here I want to go to a more contemporary time as a parliamentarian. In 2010, I met uh, Bill Browder, Browder while I was testifying before a parliamentary committee in the UK, yet another example of inter-parliamentary uh, uh, cooperation. And Bill Browder spoke to me about uh, the torture and murder of Sergei Magnitsky and then uh, invited me to table, which I did the first ever uh, legislation uh, for Sergei Magnitsky in Canada in 2011. 2012, I was joined in an important press conference, all party parliamentarians in Canada by Boris Nemtsov, then leader of the democratic movement in Russia and Vladimir Karamirza, a public, uh, leading public uh, intellectual in Russia. I mentioned this because as we proceeded with our hearings in the Canadian Parliament for the adoption of Magnitsky sanctions in February 2000, 
and, and 15, Boris Nemtsov was assassinated right outside uh, the Kremlin. And Vladimir Karamirza, who was testifying before our parliamentary uh, committee set up to look into and which then recommended the adoption of Magnitsky sanctions, returned to Russia after testifying, was poisoned, almost died, returned again in 2017, where we were still holding parliamentary uh, hearings, was uh, then again uh, poisoned on his return to Russia. And all this was a backdrop which helped to mobilize a unanimous parliamentary recommendation by our Foreign Affairs uh, Committee uh, to recommending the adoption of Magnitsky sanctions legislation, now global justice for Sergei Magnitsky legislation, which was passed unanimously by both houses of parliament in 2017, notwithstanding the threats uh, by Putin at the time of Russian retaliation if Canadian parliamentarians were to do so. At that time, I was chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights when we convened the all-party group of parliament involved and we said, look, we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated. We have to send a signal not only that we will adopt this legislation, but we will adopt it unanimously. And as I said, that legislation was adopted unanimously and Magnitsky sanctions became an important component of our work domestically. And I might add internationally, I had become the chair of the first ever interparliamentary group of justice for Sergei uh, Magnitsky established in 2013, which also helped lead the way to adoption of Magnitsky sanctions. The US became the first to do so, Canada became the section, but then uh, the UK followed last year a game changer by the adoption of Magnitsky sanctions regime by the EU, and just very recently, Australia now on the verge uh, of adopting it. So we have been globalizing uh, the movement of justice for Sergei uh, Magnitsky sanctions, but you can see political prisoners here as a looking glass uh, in that regard. The third case study that I want to mention, and very quickly, is Maduro's uh, Venezuela. And here in 2017, I became a member of an independent legal panel to look into whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity were being committed in Venezuela. After a series of hearings internationally and Canadian Parliament and, and the like, we determined in May 2018, that seven major crimes against uh, humanity uh, were being perpetrated in Venezuela. This led, and here again, you see how the interparliamentary involvement leads to intergovernmental work. This led to the first ever collective refer re referral by seven sovereign states led by Canada of a state party, Venezuela, to the International uh, Criminal Court. Now, pleased to say that after continuing engagement on a parliamentary level, domestically and internationally. Recently, uh, the special prosecutor for an international, for the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, opened up the first ever investigation now into crimes against uh, humanity in Venezuela with respect to those responsible for the commission of those crimes. But I, I don't want to uh, close on this thing with Venezuela without mentioning uh, the pain and plight of a particular political uh, prisoner uh, who's a looking glass into Maduro's repression, a looking glass into that authoritarianism. I'm referring to Judge Maria Lourdes Afuni, uh, who some uh, 12 years ago was arbitrarily uh, detained and tortured in uh, detention and, and sentenced uh, to 10 years in prison for doing nothing other than discharging her responsibilities as a judge and a quitting uh, a political uh, prisoner at the time. For that, she was brutally tortured. That became known as the Afuni effect because the Maduro regime held that out to others in the judiciary and the like, that if you engage in that kind of conduct, i.e. protecting the rule of law, independence of the judiciary, like as Judge Maria Doris Afuni had done, you will end up, as she did, tortured in detention. And the Maduro regime, on the completion of her 10-year term, then invented a new crime of spiritual corruption and sentenced her to another uh, five years in prison. And I mentioned her case and cause as something, of course, that Parliamentarians uh, for Global Action uh, has been engaged in with a view to 
seeing this as a looking glass into Maduro's uh, repression in that regard. The fourth uh, case study uh, that I want to mention here very uh, quickly is, is that of uh, Raif Badawi, the uh, imprisoned uh, blogger in Saudi Arabia. I mentioned this case uh, because uh, in 2014, I became uh, international legal counsel to Raif uh, Badawi. His wife and three children had come to Canada as refugees. They since have become uh, Canadian citizens. They asked me to take up his case and cause, and we have been engaged in that at a parliamentary level, domestically and internationally in uh, Raif Badawi's case and cause. Indeed, he was uh, imprisoned and sentenced to 10 years in prison. He's now in the 10th year of that imprisonment for saying 10 years ago what Mohammed bin Salman, the leader of Saudi Arabia, has been saying for the last five years himself, namely calling for a more uh, open Saudi Arabia, a more a moderate Islam and uh, the like. But I mentioned this because in 2018, and this relates to the resurgent global authoritarianism on the one hand and the backsliding of democracies on the other. In the summer of 2018, the then Foreign Minister of Canada, Christia Freeland, issued a call for the release not only of Raif Badawi, but his uh, sister, uh, Samar Badawi, who had been imprisoned for calling for the right to drive a reform that Mohammed bin Salman instituted, but then arrested all the women who had called for that uh, right to drive. And so she tweeted a call for the release of Raif Badawi and his sister, Samar Badawi. The Saudi authorities erupted in fury. They recalled the Canadian ambassador, uh, the Saudi ambassador from Canada, ejected the Canadian ambassador from Saudi Arabia, suspended all trade and investment with Canada, recalled some 15,000 Saudi students studying in Canada, really a self-inflicted wound. But why I'm saying all this, because not one democracy came to Canada's defense. And two months later, we witnessed, we witnessed the brutal assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian a, a journalist. That served finally as a wake-up call for the international community on a governmental level, on a parliamentary level. It led to the first ever uh, founding of the World Press Freedom Conference, the establishment of the Media Freedom a coalition, the uh, high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom, on which I sit, and where media freedom has become a centerpiece of one's work. And let me close in that regard with one last case study, because it brings together all these themes, namely combating the resurgent authoritarianism, the role and responsibility of democracies and parliamentarians, the assault on media freedom, and the like. I'm speaking now of the as we meet the case and cause of Dwight Isaac, the longest imprisoned uh, journalist in the world, a Swedish Eritrean a journalist. He was arrested in the wake of 9-11 uh, in Eritrea, a country that ranks 180 out of 180 countries in the World uh, Press Freedom Index. And he has been held virtually incommunicado ever since for these last 20 years denied any access to family, any consular uh, representation, any right to counsel, any right to appear before an independent uh, tribunal, tortured in uh, detention and the like. And so uh, recently uh, we came together, parliamentarians, uh, media organizations, uh, NGOs and, and the like, to put forth a five-point action plan with regard uh, to securing uh, the release of Dwight Isaac and holding Eritrea accountable. This includes the imposition of Magnitsky sanctions on the Eritrean leadership. It's astonishing that that has not yet uh, been done. Invoking, uh, and we talk about parliamentary initiatives and government initiatives that are very important. Uh, Canada led in February uh, 2021, the adoption of the first ever declaration on arbitrary uh, detention of uh, in this instance, uh, dual nationals. And so this is something we've asked. The, there are now 67 signatories to this Declaration on Arbitrary Detention to mobilize together to secure the release 
of uh, Dwight Isaac. There are other initiatives, parliamentary level and the like, I won't go into it, but basically we sought here and are seeking to globalize the advocacy on behalf of uh, Dwight Isaac. And I should mention, because I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this uh, case as well. I'm uh, sorry, but Professor Kotler, but we yeah. are uh, running a bit out of time. Uh, I will, yeah. It'll take me one, <laughs> two minutes and I will close. Thank you, thank you. Very important case. I'm talking about the iconic woman, human rights lawyer, Nasreen Soutadeh in Khamenei's Iran, who's gone down the line uh, for women, uh, for juveniles destined for execution, for journalists whose freedom of speech has been silenced, for the Baha'is of religiously persecuted minority, for other lawyers, until she herself became a political prisoner three years ago, sentenced to 148, uh, so sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes. I mentioned her case because she is a looking glass into Khamenei's repression. She is a looking glass for the parliamentarians to be able to mobilize on her behalf and all the clause, causes that she represents. She's the embodiment of human rights in Iran. Her persecution and prosecution is a looking glass into the assault on human rights in Iran. And this the parliamentarians for global action can play a, an important role with respect to each of the political prisoners that I mentioned in both challenging the resurgent global authoritarianism, challenging the backsliding of democracies, challenging the assault on human rights and media freedom, and help to secure justice for victims and accountability for human rights violators. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kotler. Before we, we move forward, uh, I would like to give the floor to our PGA president because uh, she has raised her hand to uh, speak. Please thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, uh, dear colleague Rosanna. Uh, I think this discussion is really important because it shows what we can do as parliamentarians. I and mean, it's quite a lot. We can do it on national level supporting human rights. We can do it also on the international arena. And uh, there are several ways for us to cooperate. One thing is by activities, uh, be engaged and uh, use uh, uh, the academy, be involved in different organizations and others, other things. Yet, me, let me just mention a few things. Uh, as uh, Professor Irene, also mentioned Boris Nemtsov. I would like to add a few things to this because the assassination of Boris Nemtsov was, uh, it did happen in Russia. It did happen when Boris Nemtsov was just on his way to present a report on uh, corruption. He was the leading political figure in Russia who united and the opposition, and also was actually challenging the sitting president, Putin. And um, he was murdered just outside <laughs> Kreml, one of the most, uh, what shall I say, uh, the, the spots where there were most police <laughs> everywhere in Moscow, but no witness. In OSCE, Parliamentary Assembly, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, which not is Europe, it's from Vladivostok in East to uh, uh, Vancouver in, uh, in West, 57 countries in the Parliamentary Assembly. I was some years ago appointed as a special representative on the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. And this meant that I made a report. Uh, I used not only the report as such, but also hosting several side events together with civil society, together with politicians all over the world. And then at the fixed date presented the report. I mention this because it shows also how we as politicians can work uh, to use our skills, our networks. And uh, after that, the report had been debated all over the world at Chatham House. I have been there. I have been also with a seminar with uh, Canada, hosted by Canada, hosted by a, a PDA, together with Professor Irving. But also uh, the report is added to the Congress of 
In US, in the Committee of Human Rights, they have recognized it. The report is also used by European Parliament for their uh, uh, statement on, the, on Russia. I think we, as pol politicians, we can do quite a lot if we just dare to use the opportunities that we have because we have a huge range of opportunities and people are listening to us. But we need, of course, to have evidence to collect uh, support, uh, a network to do this. What I also would like to say that, uh, as was mentioned here by Professor Irving and Honorable Irving, of course, is uh, that uh, the Swedish um, journalist, uh, David Isaac, who is in Yale, in Eritrea have been so for a long, very, very long time. And I'm really sad to say this because there is a lot of initiative going on. I am familiar with some of them, but not all. And there are international network of journalists working. There are parliamentary network working. <coughs> there are governments working, including the Swedish one. It's not succeed, succeeded yet, but I think it's important to continue and use all kinds of tools. And I see it as very important that there is also an international uh, work doing on this all over political levels, because it's highlight the situation. It uh, gives also an extra pressure on the issue when it's not only the uh, Sweden who do this, when it's also come from other countries. And I think this is something that we can use as well as parliamentarians, because we have to use all our tools as parliamentarians. And this event we have here today, our annual session in parliamentarians of global action, I think this is an excellent forum to exchange views and experience that we can bring with us home for our continued work and also for the work of PDA. Thank you very much. And I will not speak any longer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, it was uh, a very interesting presentation uh, by Professor Kotler, especially um, some of the things that would stay with me is uh, when he talked about what his parents said uh, at the beginning of the speech where, uh, you know, the pursuit of justice uh, is equal to all the other commandments combined. Uh, that is so true. And that is something uh, uh, that would stay with me from this presentation. And another thing is that to feel the injustice uh, uh, is important if you want to pursue justice. So um, what we have seen, what we have just discussed is uh, actually the dangers uh, of indifference and inaction as Professor Kotler just uh, mentioned and uh, the importance of combating global authoritarianism and the important role that Magnitsky sanctions play in this. It has been highlighted over and over again in dif on different occasions in PGA meetings uh, by uh, Professor Kotler. And uh, as uh, our president, Honorable Margarita, just uh, mentioned, uh, there are so many things that we as parliamentarians can do. Our voices are not carried uh, just inside our parliaments, but uh, what we say in our parliaments becomes a global voice when we uh, work together. And the beauty of uh, Magnitsky sanctions, uh, I noticed, is that unlike uh, uh, tools like economic sanctions, uh, they do not uh, target the innocent civilians, but instead they target the human rights abusers themselves. So um, thank you so much, Professor Kotler, for sharing uh, this valuable information with us. Um, and now I'll move on to the second panelist because uh, we are already uh, <laughs> way behind the schedule. Uh, Professor Stefan Lindberg uh, is our second panelist and is the director of uh, Wiedem Institute, Department of Political Science of the University of Gothenburg. 
Professor Lindberg is also the director of DEMSCO, which is the National uh, Research Infrastructure and a Wollenberg Academy Fellow. Professor Lindberg, furthermore, is a principal investigator for uh, varieties of democracy, VDEM, and FASTEM. Today, Professor Lindberg will give us an overview of uh, what the data says about the current state of democracy worldwide and what legislator, uh, legislators should consider when drafting legislation. Professor Lindberg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation um, to speak here today. It's a special pleasure because um, I don't know if anybody in this crowd knows, but I was a PGA parliamentary fellow back in 1999 to 2001, stationed in Ghana. So Honorable Animadu Antri, special greetings to you. Uh, what is that? Um, and- um, Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've visited many times since, although it's, it's quite some time now since I was last in Ghana. But um, I'm now in a completely different role and uh, uh, I will talk to you about the trends for democracy in the world. And I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see that. And uh, uh, what the um, um, <clears throat> the drivers are uh, and what ah, now I now I did something very stupid. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this never happens to me and now it happens to me today great um let's go here again i was a little baffled because i had i thought i had changed that heading a little bit um so but we'll go with it i'll talk a little bit at the end also about um what <clears throat> legislatures should be wary about uh in what's going on right now uh <clears throat> okay so I'm going to base this some of this on uh, the democracy report from the VDEM Institute. Uh, the 2021 um, report came out in March. <clears throat> and I'm going to make just three very brief points from that. One, there's a reason we call this report autocratization turns viral, of course, in the times of the pandemic. But that's really what we're seeing. So in the last 10 years only, the share of the world population that is now live in autocracies has gone up to 68% or two thirds. Uh, how does the evidence look for that? Well, like this. So here is our liberal democracy index. Um, and you can see here from 1972 and the third wave of, of democratization that we were so happy about for so many years. And then in the last 10 years here, uh, weighted these indices, the black line in the middle for the world and then uh, different regions in the world all of them going down quite drastically. In fact, if you draw a line like this, then it becomes obvious that the level of democracy that the average global citizen enjoyed in, 2000 and, uh, in 2020 um, is back to around 1990 or even before that and the end of the Cold War. The entire expansion of freedom and rights that happened in the wake of the end of Soviet Union and the fall of, 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 of the wall and all that has on a global scale been eradicated. We can take the same underlying data and look in terms of regime types, categories, rather than on an index. And then it looks like this, uh, again from 1972, but then for many, many years, the number of really bad dictatorships we're going down and now it's going up again. And at the same period here, in the same period, the number of liberal democracies are radically declining. And the most common regime type in the world is electoral autocracy. So think of Turkey under Erdogan now, uh, Putin, Russia under Putin and so on, holding multi-party elections, at least on paper, but they are not democracies. And in fact, if you put these two categories together and you calculate the population, it's two thirds of the world. So that's the first point here. We're back on a global scale to uh, around or even before the end of the Cold War. And electoral, uh, electoral autocracies 
keeps increasing is the most common form of regime type in the world. Okay, so second, um, if we then look at the countries right now that are in change, right? So they're either going up on democracy, very few, or down. Um, we can see that one third of the world population, 2.6 billion people now live in countries that are sliding back on democratic attributes. And that's up from 6% only 10 years ago. So the evidence looks like this. Here's one graph um, where you can see again from 1972, and here really illustrating that third wave of democratization uh, at its height with a blue purple line there at its height, 72 countries were in a process of democratization at the same time. That's dwindled down to 16. And in fact, it's only 4% of the world population live in those 16 countries. So it's a bunch of small countries. Good for them and good for the world that it's happening there. Um, but at the same time, here in the last actually 20 years now, um, the number of countries undergoing autocratization has been going up and registering 25 at the end of 2020. Uh, with 34% of the world population. So that's sort of, and this is really, really worrying also from this perspective. So this is from an uh, uh, academic journal publication. We looked at all instances of autocratization taking place from 1900 to the present that started in democracies. And almost 80% of them lead to that democracy dies. So just a statistical probability that countries now in a process of autocratization, if they start in democracies, that they will survive as democracies is very slim. In fact, if we look at the top 10 autocratizers, the ones that have slid down most on democracy in the last 10 years, these are the ones. Um, and nine out of the 10 started 10 years ago as one or the other form of democracy. And then you can see the trajectory. And today, at the end of 2020, we classify seven out of the 10 as either electoral autocracies or, um, uh, 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 or uh, close autocracies, including that Hungary and India. Uh, Hungary was downgraded in 2018 and in India last year. Um, so that's the second part um, where the change that's going on now is really accelerating um, and, and it affecting democracies that are increasingly turning into non-democracies. So then the, just very briefly, um, uh, relating also to some of the things that have been said earlier about this, the freedom of expression, including the freedom of the media, is really um, the area worst affected here. And it goes beyond sort of these overall measures. Um, look at the evidence for this. So here's another graph. So this shows sort of different components of different varieties of democracy, right? So it's sort of everything. And um, if you're above the line here, that component of democracy has gotten better in more countries than it's gotten worse. And if you're below the line, it's gotten worse in more countries. Worst of all, freedom of expression. Uh, 32 countries while only getting better in 12 in the last 10 years. And in fact, if you look at the indicators that go into this, um, here are the top 20 and above the blue line, the top 10 indicators that have become worse in most countries in the world. Um, eight out of the 10 on that top 10 list are freedom of expression especially the media and worst of all repression of civil society that's gotten worse statistically significant substantially meaningfully worse in 50 countries uh in the last 10 years i give you an idea of the scale so that's um the third third point here that this threat to media and freedom of expression in general intensifies um uh, so that's sort of the, the, the three highlights I wanted to bring from this report. And then uh, what should 
you as legislatures be wary about here? Uh, what should you look at? Um, well, we have this. Uh, so, so here is as uh, one report, academic report, based on a new data set that we uh, collected on parties. Uh, parties, identities, their organization, and their behavior, and their party leaders. Um, so in my, and, and one of the things we got the data on um, across the world, and this is essentially all po political parties that were represented in legislatures um, in uh, 100, almost 160 countries. Um, so basically we took an idea from a famous political scientist, Juan Linz, about what are the signifiers of would be uh, uh, of leaders who, if they come into power, would be breaking down democracy. Um, so we operationalize them and measure that these are the four low commitment to a democratic process, demonization of political opponents, encouragement of political violence and disrespect for fundamental minority rights. And here's how it looks. Take the United States, for example. So on the uh, horizontal scale here is economic left right. Uh, and on this vertical scale, you have anti-pluralism. That is the label we use for these four indicators taken together. And with the coming of Trump uh, in the United States, uh, they've scored very high and increasingly higher on this anti-pluralism index. And we could talk for hours about all the ways in which Trump and his administration tried to and, and managed to a large extent undermine democracy in the US. I'm still worried about the future there. Take other countries, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, India. Um, same kind of trajectory, not much on the left right scale, but becoming anti pluralist by these four measures. And uh, Turkey, uh, ceased to be a democracy around 2015-16, uh, Hungary 2018, uh, India last year, uh, Poland is sliding down uh, and coming very close. But we ran this then on the entire sort of data uh, with data from the, the 1970s of, and forward on this and see if these indicators then would predict democratic breakdown and they do. So this is, without being too technical, it's just saying that um, <clears throat> the higher up you scored on these indicators, here are two of the four, right? The higher up you score on those indicators, the higher the, the, the uh, likelihood that we after that then actually observe uh, a, a process of autocratization, eventually democratic breakdown. So those four indicators, demonization of uh, opponents in particular and lack of commitment to democratic process, those are the warning signs that you as legislators should look out for in your colleagues and their parties, because that signifies actors that will undermine uh, and, and potentially break down democracy in your country. On that note, let me just say that everything we do in VDEM, everything is public. Uh, uh, it's all available. We also have online graphing tools for those who want to play around with it. Um, but, um, and, and here is a, a graph of the website on that. Yeah, here are some of the, the, the tools. And let me say thank you for listening. I hope I didn't spend too much more than my allotted time minutes. You should unmute. Uh, we yourself. can't hear you, Rosanna. Yes. Vulnerable. Rosanna, Atten Rosanna please unmute um, your microphone. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Lindbergh. That was, um, I'd say, a very uh, enlightening presentation, but very alarming statistics. Uh, I don't think any of us were this aware that uh, we've all been talking about how democracy has been declining, 
but uh, the numbers that you just showed, um, it's in fact quite alarming, especially regarding the freedom of expression and also the increase in the lack of commitment to the democratic process and the demonization of opponents. Uh, uh, I think this is all something that uh, we would like to look into further and study a bit more in the uh, coming weeks. Um, since we are quite behind schedule, I will uh, go to our next speaker. Our third speaker for the day was supposed to be um, uh, Honorable Laura Boltrini, but uh, unfortunately, um, uh, she's unable to join us today because uh, she has an emergency plenary meeting that she needed to attend and she sends her regrets. So hopefully we will see her in the future in another uh, day. So I'll move on to the fourth speaker, my colleague, Honorable Marcelo Cosa, who is a provin uh, provincial legislator, president of the Juntos UCR Bloc, legislator of uh, Cordoba, Argentina. Honorable Cosa is the former Secretary of Modernization, Communication and Strategic Development. His presentation today will deal uh, with the manipulation of information and communication technology and how to safeguard the right to privacy and freedom of expression in democratic systems. Honorable Cosa, the floor is yours. Buenos días a todos, buenos días a todas. Agradezco a las autoridades y a la Organización de Parlamentarios para la Acción Global por la invitación a exponer el caso de Argentina, de mi país, y los riesgos para los derechos humanos que supone la manipulación de las tecnologías de información y comunicación por parte de los gobiernos. Las TIC han jugado un rol central en la crisis global desatada por el COVID-19. Gobiernos de todo el mundo, con el pretexto de prevenir y contener la pandemia, han implementado estas tecnologías de forma no justificada o desproporcionada en contravención con el derecho a la libertad de expresión y el derecho a la privacidad de la ciudadanía. Es importante que creemos conciencia sobre las causas y los riesgos de estas prácticas para así mejorar la calidad de nuestras democracias. El derecho a la libertad de expresión y el derecho a la privacidad están consagrados en la Constitución Nacional Argentina en los artículos 14, 32 y 19 respectivamente. Son derechos fundamentales, son derechos inalienables. El derecho a la libertad de expresión implica el derecho individual a que toda persona exprese sus ideas sin censura previa y el derecho colectivo a que todos podamos buscar, recibir y difundir información de toda índole. Por su parte, el derecho a la privacidad protege de las injerencias arbitrarias a las acciones y hechos del ámbito íntimo y doméstico de la persona que no ofendan al orden y la moral pública, ni perjudiquen a un tercero. La misma Constitución Argentina establece como instrumentos de excepción, como instrumentos de excepción, los decretos de necesidad y urgencia, la delegación legislativa, la intervención federal y el estado de sitio. Este último, el estado de sitio, ha sido utilizado históricamente por los gobiernos de facto para interrumpir el Estado de Derecho. El último informe del Instituto Internacional para la Democracia y la Asistencia Electoral, presentado hace pocos días en Panamá, expone que más del 50% de los países de América Latina y el Caribe muestran señales de erosión democrática, retroceso democrático o decididos ataques a las instituciones. Todo esto como resultado de las limitaciones impuestas por los gobiernos durante el COVID-19. Aún más, el 70% de los países de nuestra región 
ha experimentado un aumento de la corrupción durante la pandemia. Y repito este dato porque creo que es absolutamente doloroso y preocupante. El 70% de los países de nuestra región han experimentado un aumento de los índices de corrupción durante la pandemia. Lamentablemente, mi país, Argentina, no es la excepción. En mi país, los decretos de necesidad y urgencia fueron la herramienta del Poder Ejecutivo para tomar decisiones unilaterales que promovieron la desinformación, el ciberpatrullaje, el cierre de los parlamentos y la limitación de la separación de los poderes y como consecuencia la corrupción. En primer lugar, si bien se habla de las fake news como prácticas de desinformación en la era de la posverdad, entiendo que poco se dice que son los mismos gobiernos los que institucionalizan la desinformación cuando restringen deliberadamente el acceso de los ciudadanos a los datos públicos. Argentina ha descendido 12 puestos en el ranking de transparencia internacional en el último año de medición. Y no solo eso, Especialmente durante el 2020, no solo se dificultó el acceso a la información y el control público, sino que se implementaron medidas de vigilancia en redes, dirigidas no a la presunta comisión de delitos, sino a aquello que se conoce como ciberpatrullaje de contenidos, limitando la libertad de expresión y el derecho a la privacidad de las personas. A poco de iniciada la llamada cuarentena, en Argentina el gobierno abrió una causa penal a Kevin Guerra, un joven de 20 años que por hacer una broma en la red social Twitter a partir de una publicación personal en la que mencionó la palabra saqueo. Una causa penal abrió el gobierno a un ciudadano por un tuit. Organizaciones civiles que trabajan con datos abiertos elaboraron un informe rechazando el reglamento dispuesto por el Ministerio de Seguridad. Otro ejemplo, el gobernador de la provincia de Chaco, Jorge Capitanich, solicitó en su momento a empresas de telefonía móvil la información de ubicuidad de los ciudadanos chaqueños para realizarles seguimiento de movilidad diaria y corregir, textualmente es, es esta frase, corregir comportamientos. Los diputados opositores al gobierno del presidente Alberto Fernández pidieron informes luego de tomar conocimiento de que la app del Ministerio de Salud Pública que realizaba autotest de coronavirus permitía controlar a los usuarios a través de geolocalización. Poco tiempo después, la Defensoría del Pueblo, que es un organismo nacional, lanzó NODIO. NODIO era un observatorio de desinformación que fue resistido y denunciado por la Sociedad Interamericana de Prensa y la Asociación de Entidades Periodísticas Argentinas por entender que violaba los principios constitucionales de libertad de prensa y expresión. En segundo lugar, coincidentemente con el aislamiento social preventivo y obligatorio, en Argentina se cerraron los parlamentos de todo el país en todos los niveles de gobierno de manera total. Y ustedes saben mejor que yo lo que sucede cuando se cierran los parlamentos, lo que empieza a languidecer es la democracia, se hiere de muerte a la democracia de todos los países. Desde Córdoba, desde mi provincia, fui uno de los impulsores, quizás el primero me animo a decir, para que legisladores de mi provincia y de todo el país reclamáramos de manera urgente 
la apertura de los congresos de los parlamentos municipales, provinciales y nacionales. Nuestro grito fue, abran los parlamentos. En emergencia necesitamos más democracia, más parlamentos abiertos y no menos democracia. Recién, al cabo de dos meses y luego de la protesta de representantes legislativos, logramos que se instauren sesiones virtuales y después de un año y medio, el Congreso Nacional volvió a sesionar de manera presencial. En tercer lugar, durante la pandemia aumentaron los casos de corrupción en todo el país, en todo mi país, de la mano de la falta de datos, de la dificultad de la ciudadanía por acceder a la información y, consecuentemente, la dificultad a la hora de poder controlar cómo se gastaban y cómo se gastan los recursos públicos. La corrupción nos priva de información, nos priva de recursos. La corrupción nos priva del goce de nuestros derechos. Por eso, en mi país decimos, y no nos cansamos de repetir, que la corrupción mata. Y voy a dar dos casos emblemáticos que ilustran lo que acabo de decir. El primero, lo que se conoció en Argentina como la vacunación VIP, el vacunatorio VIP. Fui uno de los pocos que se animó a denunciar públicamente y poner a disposición de la justicia el listado de políticos, funcionarios, empresarios y amigos del poder que accedieron a vacunas de manera preferencial, violando el plan de vacunación gradual que daba prioridad de acceso al grupo de riesgo formado por mayores de 60 años, enfermos crónicos, personal de la salud, personal de la educación, personal de la fuerza de seguridad. Esto dinamitó nuestro derecho de igualdad ante la ley y la garantía de equidad que deben tener todos los gobiernos democráticos. Aún hoy, a más de un año de haber hecho esta denuncia, seguimos esperando en mi provincia que la justicia resuelva sobre más de mil casos demostrados de funcionarios, de políticos, de amigos del poder que saltándose la cola se vacunaron mucho antes de lo que le correspondía conforme el cronograma recientemente enunciado. Por eso decimos que la corrupción mata, porque por cada dirigente político, por cada funcionario por cada legislador que se vacunó cuando no correspondía vacunarse, había un adulto mayor que dejaba de recibir su vacuna y había muchos de ellos que por no recibir la vacuna en tiempo y en forma, terminaron falleciendo. El segundo caso, la violencia institucional desatada en el cumplimiento de las restricciones establecidas por decreto. En mi computadora, tengo escrito desde hace más de un año, Justicia por Blas. Justicia por Blas es hoy una de las causas de amnistía internacional. Un adolescente de apenas 17 años fue asesinado por la espalda por un grupo de policías. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but uh, since we are already behind schedule and uh, uh, your time was 10 minutes, so I would like to ask you to. Uh, Close soon. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. Sí, por favor, pido, les pido disculpas yo por haberme extendido. Mencionaba este caso de este joven adolescente que fue asesinado por la espalda por no haberse detenido en un control. El caso todavía no ha llegado a juicio y los responsables materiales esperamos que sean juzgados al igual que los responsables políticos. Para ir eh, eh, finalizando... La falta de transparencia y la restricción de los derechos y las libertades contribuyen a la crisis de confianza. Un, un reciente informe de una consultora nacional revela que el 80% de los argentinos no confían en la dirigencia política. ¿Cuál es la buena noticia? La ciudadanía es la buena noticia. Y haciendo no eco de esta crisis de confianza que existe en Argentina y en nuestra provincia, hemos presentado un six pack, seis leyes para mejorar la calidad institucional. Una de ellas está acá a mi espalda, el proyecto de ley de ficha limpia para que los corruptos no puedan ser candidatos, una ley de ética e integridad en la función pública, una ley de despersonalización de la comunicación, un plan de metas de gobierno, 
una ley de acceso a la información pública y una ley de aplicación de derechos de declaraciones juradas. En definitiva, y cerrando, estoy convencido, al igual que ustedes, de que el único camino que permite reconstruir la democracia es recuperar la confianza de la ciudadanía, recuperar la confianza de nuestros pueblos en el Estado, garantizar la transparencia, la ética de los gobernantes y los derechos civiles es el único reaseguro de calidad democrática en la región. Muchísimas gracias y le pido disculpas por haberme extendido en el tiempo. Uh, please John Roy, thank you, thank you so much. Um, that was a, a very interesting uh, experience that you shared of what happened in Argentina, and uh, uh, I couldn't agree with you more on your uh, concluding statement that the way forward is to gain the trust of citizens, and that is what we should all be trying to do in this time of corruption and the lack of transparency, as you mentioned. Thank you once again. I will now uh, move on to our last um, speaker. Uh, I, I would like to introduce Ms. Sandra Papera, who is the Senior Associate and Director for Gender, Women and Democracy at the National Democratic Institute. Ms. Pepera will speak to us today about what legislators can do to support the fundamental human rights of women and girls in difficult and repressive context. Ms. Pepera, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rosina, and thank you to PGA for uh, having me uh, on this um, important uh, session this year. PGA's sessions are always important, but I think perhaps this year, given um, all that is going on and we've heard so much already, um, it is particularly important. I do want to say that um, what I'm going to say today um, owes as much to my colleague Kristen Sample and her team, who are the democratic governance leads in our um, organization, and focus uh, more concretely uh, on parliamentarians. Um, so, I mean, there's some things that I don't need to say um, uh, to you, but I will say because it's sometimes necessary to validate the women amongst you that you know we are stuck a bit at 25% representation, clearly. And, you know, that hotbed of radical feminism, the World Economic Forum um, actually claims that the political empowerment gap at 75% is the single biggest gender empowerment gap of all. It's bigger than finance, it's bigger than education, it's bigger than health. It is the biggest, and it will take on current trajectories um, almost a century to close. But gender is not the only fault line. And whilst I'm really pleased to see um, Rosena and um, the, the previous uh, chair as younger representatives, you know, um, less than 2% of all parliamentarians are women under uh, 30. Uh, and I have to uh, give a, a, small, um, a small illustration. When I was in Sri Lanka in 2019, in September 2019, there were more men over 70 in the Sri Lankan parliament than there were women. So, you know, we need to look at this very carefully. And the reason for this is, I think we should all by now be very, very clear that um, without inclusion, we do not get democratic resilience. And we certainly don't get some of the other issues that have been discussed, uh, accountability and so on. Yes, it's a question of rights, but it's also a question of democratic culture. Uh, and I think uh, we, we know that inclusion is good for all of us. It actually addresses things that all of us of all genders and none would need um, to, to have. In the, in the specific area of what parliamentarians can do at this point in time, you know, I do want to say, and it, it, it's interesting because listening to my previous uh, panelists, each of them touched on the issue of gender in different ways. Uh, Professor Kotler actually uh, named a number of women who were on the front lines and having their human rights abuses. I would add a couple more, Senator Rosa de Lima in, in the Philippines uh, and um, the young woman in Belarus who uh, has been um, you know, sent to prison for being part of that uh, reform movement. So there, there are others, they may be more recent, they may be newer, but we're seeing women um, both stepping forward and being um, um, recipients of a huge backlash uh, when they do so. And this is a political issue. Yes, there is misogyny involved, but we're seeing it more and more as a deliberate political tactic by the authoritarians. 
And let me show you how even um, uh, our colleague, Professor Lindbergh's work reflects this. When he listed the top 10 uh, indicators of uh, 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 media freedoms, uh, the rollback of media freedoms, number one was civil society repression. Civil society is the premier route for women's access to politics. Most women who access politics access it through a civil society um, kind of track first. And number four actually said that the, uh, the freedom, of, uh, freedom of expression for women had declined. So of your top 10, I recognize at least two that have specific gendered impacts. Uh, and, 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 and I think these, the, the point I'm trying to make is that as we look at the space, um, it's not to say that everything is equally fine for all populations. Uh, Rosanna just reminded us of the need to represent the interests of all folks. But as we're moving forward, we're seeing that some folks are particularly uh, under pressure uh, and under stress uh, from the current anti-authoritarian backlash. Definitely uh, the... the uh, uh, the weakness of um, some of our democratic principles. And also I would say the shocks that are, um, are, are rolling through all of our, um, uh, all of our uh, key uh, um, political and social and public spaces. So I think, you know, even as there was some discussion earlier on about how do parliaments vote uh, when they are, uh, uh, in a hybrid session, that, that move to online politics, it has very different gendered uh, impacts as well, because most women in the world still do not have access to smartphones. And even when they do, the issue of strong connectivity and the ability to access them every day is not assured. So I think thinking very clearly and carefully about both the rights that women should have and their ability to access those rights and particularly the right to be politically active with some of the new uh, mechanisms that are being introduced into our political life is uh, particularly important. Because when we see uh, and when we understand the importance of women to uh, building resilience and, um, and positive recovery, you know, one of the key things that we note is that despite the proven um, uh, uh, impacts and the positive impacts, when it comes to women's engagement in any post-shock, including conflict, including um, natural disaster, including pandemic, we see that they remain a minority of parliamentarians in some of these situations. So this business about even the formal, uh, the formal measurement of women's political participation which is the parliamentary piece. And it's not the only measurement, but it's the most handy, it's a proxy for how women uh, engage. Even that formal measurement tells us that post-shock, you're going to have a, an issue with women's participation. And if your shock is one that actually um, prevents, for example, physical gathering or movement or introduces, somebody mentioned it earlier, new states of emergency laws or actually shrinks the political space so that only a few people um, are involved in the decision-making, all those things will exclude women. And when you exclude women, you exclude other marginalized groups. We've done some focused research, for example, on the, um, the impact of COVID-19 on women's political exclusion. And that's been done by my uh, colleague, the uh, NDI senior gender advisor and a researcher at Carnegie Endowment. Uh, and we saw sort of four threats coming through, um, economic precarity and the return to traditional gender roles, a greater reliance on informal political practices that reinforce male political dominance, inequities in access to online platforms and decreased public vis visibility. All of these are amenable to action by MPs as legislators, but also as members of political parties. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we forget that MPs are not only in party blocks in the house, but they are members of their political parties and they have a responsibility in those spaces 
uh, as well. But there were four opportunities at least, and some of them are to do with the fact, I think also previously mentioned about the number of women, for example, who are stepping forward into politics as a result of some of these uh, challenges and issues that we're facing around the place. But again, for you as parliamentarians, I think that there is an opportunity uh, to reimagine reimagine some existing governance paradigms, as well as the gender norms that underpin them. You know, crises can spur new behaviors and periods of rebuilding uh, can open up opportunities to push for policies that shift inequitable gender norms and give rise to more resilient governance systems. At the end of the day, I think for MPs, um, it's always the budget. I mean, the budget, you are absolutely key and central to budgets. Uh, and the budget reflects the values of a country, who it values, whose work it values, and who it rewards, and who and what and whose work it doesn't. I think that's a, you know, it's a hugely uh, impactful quotation from Preg's Govinda from 1996. So the budget is a value statement and the determination of your nation's values can be asserted by how the budget is actually formed and allocated. And I would say that particularly now, the need to really analyze the gendered impacts of the resource allocations uh, for the post-COVID recovery, for example, are going to be key. Um, I was privileged to see some analysis done by a member of the UK Women's Budget Group on the impacts of European Union recovery funds on the employment and recovery needs of women and men, and which would have the most impact on the totality of the recovery. And it was shocking because in every single um, uh, dimension, the priorities were on things like construction and transport, which were very good for male, um, uh, for male employment, uh, whereas where, where women's employment and women's recovery was best focused, which is education, health, and accommodation, all of which actually are better for the totality of the society, all of those were much less. I mean, it was almost inverse. If you look at the graphs, it, it, it's laughable, really, the, um, the, dis, um, the dis, uh, uh, dissonance between real impact for the whole of society and some impact for some part of society. It's rather like, and I'm going to um, uh, uh, shout out to Sweden, you know, it's that whole business about Sweden's um, ice clearance policy, which doesn't actually start with the main commuter routes because the commuter routes serve only those who commute. It starts with the neighborhoods because the neighborhoods then unlock the ability for those who are trapped by snow in the neighborhoods, women, older folks, children going to school and so forth. That's the way to think about how we should move forward. What is the, what is the impact for the greatest number of people? And that might mean making very different budget allocation decisions. And briefly, let me say a, a few specific areas that I would ask uh, parliamentarians to look at in this, this um, focus on uh, uh, on women and protecting women's rights. Um, I've already mentioned closing the digital, digital gender gap is hugely important. And I think I would ask you to use as your metrics what the Alliance for Affordable Internets have used, which is meaningful connectivity. And meaningful connectivity uh, means the ability to use the internet every day using an appropriate device with enough data and a fast connection. So every day, an appropriate device, enough data and a fast connection, really important. I think another area clearly is we do need to look at some of our social policies to try and unstereotype the division of responsibilities that has women and girls in some places spending 10 times more time than men on unpaid care and domestic work. And again, this is good for everybody. This is not just good for women and girls, because if we rebalance this, then some of the pressures that some men certainly feel to show up every day at work and miss their family life can also be uh, addressed. 
And we are spending a lot of money with the most educated generation of all time. Uh, and girls are part of that. We're spending a lot of money in our investments in education and then failing to provide the social support structures that allow women and girls to actually move into the um, uh, uh, economy and into the employment. And then finally, my last piece, and I have to say this, of course, is a focus on what has you know, now been called the shadow pandemic, although it preceded any other pandemics, the issue of violence against women and girls. And this must be a place where parliamentarians, um, you, you look uh, and look closely at yourselves uh, and at your parties and at your, um, your agendas to really put in place structures, policies, resources that uh, tackle this scourge on our societies. Um, the issue of violence against women and girls has been given, as I said, a new spotlight because of COVID-19, but it has been one of the longest abuses of women and girls' rights um, from the dawn of time, we should say. It's time now that we all took some action to address that. Thank you, and again, my apologies if I took too long. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pepper. You were just uh, right on time. Uh, we've seen uh, very interesting um, uh, problems and uh, also the solutions to those problems, which Ms. Pepper has addressed. For example, as she said, uh, budget allocation is something that could uh, play a very important role uh, to make sure that the budget is gender balanced and uh, it focuses on the gender issues uh, which we face every day. For example, um, uh, recently we did a survey in Maldives uh, to see why uh, women are not uh, performing uh, some type of jobs, for example, working in industries like the tourism industry, which is the main industry in Maldives, and yet we see uh, very few women working there. Uh, uh, we looked at why this is and what we have seen is uh, that uh, jobs were being stereotyped and also due to cultural beliefs uh, it was uh, not seen as an appropriate place for girls to work uh, you leave your home and go to resorts and work there and this is not seen as something appropriate to be done and also um, i found it interesting the way you touched uh, how new technological tools uh, can be used for the development of women and uh, as a way to make our voices heard. And of course, uh, as parliamentarians, uh, we can do more certainly to ensure that uh, girls have access to the internet and because that is uh, one platform where whether somebody uh, allows us or not, we still get the mic. We can still uh, have our uh, thoughts out there for everybody to see. So um, I find that uh, that is uh, another important area that we as parliamentarians uh, can touch on. And then of course, there's the domestic violence and child abuse, which saw a surge during the pandemic, especially when people are forced to stay in their homes. Um, and there was a uh, even here in Maldives, which is a, you know, a, a small country with a small population. And yet we saw so many cases of child abuse during uh, uh, the pandemic. So yeah, as you uh, reflected, uh, it is very clear how the budget comes out and what our priorities are when the budget comes out. Uh, most of the time we see um, most of the focus is on economic development and uh, much less focus is given for the social sector and uh, uh, solving the social problems that we have. And uh, I find that um, one of the ways that we can uh, solve this problem is finding ways to have more women in the parliaments. Because uh, we see that uh, during the budget uh, speeches, if you uh, listen carefully, you will see that most of the speeches given by uh, men, please don't take any offense on this, but uh, is more focused on uh, economic development and hardly on issues like drugs, like uh, uh, domestic violence, like child abuse. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, um, what Ms. Pepera has highlighted has been an eye-opener for all of us, something that we can all take back and uh, use uh, 
next time we work on our budgets as well. Uh, so um, since we are, as I said, uh, way behind schedule, uh, we will move to the interactive session. And uh, I would like to ask you to raise your hand to request for the flow. And the raise hand function is in the chat box. Uh, it would be very helpful if you would speak slowly so that the interpreters can translate questions or comments accurately. For questions, kindly mention which panelist the question is directed to. The floor is open for questions. Um, Honorable uh, Adam, I think uh, Honorable Wade Mark had asked for the floor uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, um, <clears throat> are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, first of all, may I on behalf of our national chapter in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, extend heartfelt congratulations to the organizers of this first day of a two-day forum by our organization and to really extend our collective appreciation to all of those who have spoken and presented thus far. I would like um, to ask um, maybe through the Secretariat, what measures can be taken to enlighten our participants um, at this very important forum, as it relates to our first presenter, who gave us an understanding of some of the outcomes of the Summit for Democracy. And we were advised that, you know, over 100 participants or leaders took part in that particular forum um, or summit. It is important to hold our leaders accountable and in our struggle to defend our democratic values and norms and principles, as well as institutions that are now experiencing a democratic recession. I would like to ask the Secretariat if they can secure on behalf of all of us, you know, the, the leaders that would have participated in that particular summit as well as the undertakings that they would have given to the summit so that we in our respective countries can hold those leaders to account so that as we continue to struggle against authoritarianism and, at, and attempts to, to, to regress our respective democracies, those leaders who have attended this summit for democracy held by the President of the United States, we can have an account of the commitments given and thereby hold them accountable in our respective countries. So I would like to get a response from our Secretary General um, to this particular intervention. If the gentleman who spoke very early in the program has already left to see what can be done to provide and or to facilitate the request I am making on behalf of not only myself, but I dare say all participants as we seek to promote and defend our respective democracies from the kind of incursions that we are witnessing today. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Honorable. And in fact, we are very lucky to have Sandra Pepera with us because she represents the National Democratic Institute, which has been the entry point. I want to say this because we are very grateful for PGA to work with the uh, World Summit of Democracy. So Sandra, please. And Professor Carothers, of course, is one of big, the biggest academics in the US and in the world behind the work of NDI, of the, um, uh, also of the World Summit for Democracy and also of the UN Democracy Fund. Um, Sandra. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, David. Um, uh, Honorable uh, Wade Mark, I think 
um, you will find all the, as far as I know, you'll find all the interventions made by each and every leader who went to the summit. Uh, you'll find them on the um, State Department website. So you can actually just go through. Uh, I, I mean, we have uh, we had note takers um, sit through them, but um, I think it's it's probably best to um, to hear them uh, each on the uh, each as they spoke them. Um, let me just also um, take uh, this opportunity to say, with regards to what they committed to on the gender and women's piece, um, there you know it was sort of all over the place. Some very making very specific. Uh, commitments to introducing quotas or to uh, changing some particular uh, rule or law, and the others basically aspirationally saying, we just want more women and so forth. So it's a very mixed bag with regards to that, but I think you will be able to um, listen to your um, your own uh, leadership uh, in um, uh, his own voice uh, on the State Department website. And it is a one year process. President Biden and the leaders, they concluded that this is just the starting point of a 12 month open process. That's my understanding. And Melissa Verpil, our director of the Democratic Renewal Campaign can confirm the term democratic renewal is the main label of the exercise for yes. one year, which is our yes. campaign since 2018. Yes. So I think PGA will have the credentials, I think, to continue to work with the uh, uh, US and all the major democracies of the world and create a partnership. One point that I wanted to make in the, now we are eating the time of the uh, summary of the uh, meeting, and then we have the final words from our International Council Chairperson, Navid Kamar, uh, connecting from Islamabad with us very late at night, was that one thing that we would like to press, and uh, I don't know if Sandra and the other experts agree, is to make parliamentarians under attack as human rights defenders. Because when parliamentarians are under attack, civil and political rights, including the freedom of expression, are under attack, the, and democracy is under attack. And unfortunately, this indicator is not yet present in any matrix. We have seen it with our uh, the fantastic presentation from Professor Stefan Lindbergh. We have seen it with the UN Democracy Fund um, materials and other uh, excellent uh, matrixes that ex exist, uh, Freedom House and others, but the parliamentarians are not yet seen as one of the main actors defending human rights and democracy. So maybe we have 12 months on behalf of PGA to make that cause known. And this hopefully will help parliamentarians like you, Honorable Wade Mark, who are fighting from the opposition to defend certain rights that are being threatened in your country as well as in other countries of the world. I think, David, just to, to underline the point that actually um, uh, Honorable Wade Mark made, which is the accountability point. Um, and, you know, we were pressing even ahead of the, uh, of the summit that there should be a process whereby um, exactly what you're saying is that at the national level, commitments are monitored, reported on and engaged with ahead of the, the, um, the summit uh, in, at the end of next year. So that for us is a key area. And for those of you who have um, uh, NDI programs in your countries, I think you'll find that there will be some activity to support exactly that uh, at that level. But I think it's an absolutely key point. They can't come and make commitments, come back in a year's time, and nobody has had any chance to, um, to reflect on the commitments that have been made. Um, I think uh, we can close the session now because I don't see any more hands raised. So uh, I will hand over the floor uh, to the Secretariat. Um, and thank you, uh, David and Melissa. Uh, and a very special thank you to all the panelists for the wonderful uh, uh, presentations you've made and for the wonderful discussions we've had. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. And I want to give the floor to Melissa Verpil, who is the director of the Democratic Renewal and Human Rights Campaign for a brief uh, uh, report that will not be a report because there is no time, but we will, of course, work on it in writing. Melissa, please go ahead. 
Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much, Rosina, for being here with us. I know it's very late for you. Thank you to all those who stayed the course. I know this, this program has been quite long. Um, I would simply like to add to all that has been said that within the Democratic Renewal and, and Human Rights Campaign of PGA, we look forward to engaging with all of you on different tools and best practices to tackle specific areas of democratic backsliding because democracy, authoritarianism are concepts that, are can, that can be very broad. And I think that in this program, um, there are some specific uh, problems that, that were highlighted that legislators can work on. So we've, we've seen threats and persecution of human rights defenders and parliamentarians, especially women in politics. We also saw broadly the declining trustworthiness of information and the rise in dangerous speech, which can increase the, the risk of violence. We also saw the violation of democratic principles, such as the separation of power, the executive really infringing upon the, the legislative and sometimes undermining the independence of the judiciary. So um, within this campaign, we have developed three uh, tools, three major tools. The first one, we have a forum um, to support human rights defenders at risk and also parliamentarians can be human rights defenders, and they are very often at risk, especially women parliamentarians. So there's a parliamentary rapid response team that you can engage with on this particular topic. Um, second, we have another tool, which is some sort of self-regulation by parliamentarians. It's the Global Parliamentary Code of Democratic Conduct um, to help parliamentarians be accountable because accountability is key, transparency is key, and it's important for them to be accountable for their political discourse, for what they say and the impact that they have. Um, and thirdly, which is a tool that we're currently developing, it's the Global Parliamentary Toolkit, which will compile some data and tools to tackle contemporary challenges that are more nuanced and complex than in previous phases of democratic backsliding. So this is what I wanted to say about the campaign. I look forward to engaging with all of you. And on behalf of the Secretary, I thank you so much for being here with us today. And I, and I think I hand over the floor to Honorable Navi Kamar from Pakistan for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, starting from, uh, I think, the Honorable uh, Valerie Woods, uh, uh, Margarita, our president, uh, as well as David, uh, and our two uh, board members uh, from my neighborhood generally, uh, uh, both Rosina Adam, as well as Kasturi, for having conducted a very wonderful uh, full day's work uh, of the workshop. I think the first one uh, message that comes across very strongly for us parliamentarians from this discourse is that we are not alone. That whatever we experience, the difficulties that we are going through is now, uh, uh, has uh, is past, unfortunately, becoming the norm. And if the whole world is moving in a certain uh, way against the whole democratization process, we together can work to ensure that uh, we retard uh, this uh, process and, in fact, uh, start uh, reversing it. I think the trend, uh, uh, though worldwide, uh, has its roots in, in the leadership provided by the United States uh, in terms of how it, uh, the entire process of democracy was undermined under the previous uh, uh, rule. Uh, having said that, uh, obviously, uh, you have heard a whole uh, discourse uh, over the day, so I won't add that much more to it. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who participated, who is currently still online and has the uh, stamina to stay on, uh, as well as, of course, those who made all of this possible, the uh, uh, <coughs> Danita and uh, Sida, uh, uh, as well as the Canadian uh, <coughs> a, a group that has sponsored uh, today's uh, uh, meeting and uh, I hope uh, that now with this thing becoming a global phenomena, this uh, uh, support will not only continue, but will actually grow because it's an area where it is needed. If a parliamentarian is not safe and not free uh, to be able to work in safe uh, things, then I don't think anybody else in this world will be free. So on that note, I'll say uh, goodbye and good night to everybody uh, from Pakistan. 
Thank you, Navid. Thank you. And uh, we invite, of course, everyone to join tomorrow in day two, the International Oceans Day here at the annual forum of PGA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you and have a good evening. Tomorrow. Bye. Thank See you tomorrow. Good night.